going to go ahead and get started so we uh, don't keep uh, Mark trapped here too long. He's got a uh, bigger fish to fry uh, down the street. So I've got the pleasure of, uh, uh, of introducing the next speaker, um, uh, Mark Claver, who's a friend of, of mine and, and obviously somebody a lot of the folks in this room know pretty well from the last decade or so of these discussions. Um, Mark is uh, a senior advisor, economic advisor to Vice President Pence, and before that was with Cato, and uh, prior to that was with ranking member, then ranking member Shelby, with the Senate Banking Committee, so he's been at this a long time. Um, but fancy pedigree aside, Mark's a pretty important voice on these issues right now, uh, in part because of the seat he holds, which makes him, um, makes him quite significant to how these issues play out over the next several years, uh, but also because uh, Mark uh, presents as philosophically pure and thoughtful a, a, a vision on housing policy as, uh, as one is likely to find. You may not agree with him, and Lord knows I don't on any number of issues, probably the majority of issues, but um, maybe more comment about me than, than Mark. Um, but you know why he holds his views, you know what they are, you know how they fit together. Uh, he's immensely transparent and thoughtful uh, in, his, uh, in his frame of reference and his philosophy for how uh, housing policy should be considered. Um, so he's a really important person to hear from now in particular uh, as this administration begins to turn uh, its sights uh, a bit more strongly on housing policy in the months uh, in year to come. So with that, Mark, uh, take it away. And at the end of this, he'll do a little Q&A if we've got time. Thanks, Mark. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. I appreciate that kind of introduction. And first, let me say, uh, certainly continue eating. Don't stop at my account. Uh, in fact, I think the more you eat, the less chance there is that we're going to have any sort of food fight. So, <laughs> growing up that way, um, you know. But let me also thank uh, both CoreLogic and the Urban Institute. As Jim mentioned, I feel like I've been at this for a long time. It was good to see uh, Frank Notaf and Sam Cater when I walked in. I've known those guys for over 20 years. Starting to make me feel old. How long we've been at this? Uh, hopefully, I'd like to think we're not going to be doing this for another 20 years. Um, but uh, again, I want to also really kind of express, you know, I've seen the rest of the agenda and it really is, you guys have put together a stellar agenda uh, and I wish I could be here, you know, all day for it. Uh, but again, because you have a really large number of thoughtful speakers, um, so I'm quite flattered to be among that. Uh, let me also say b before I begin that, you know, of course our, our, our focus and our hearts and prayers are with New York right now um, before we turn to some of the housing issues. But I also wanted to clarify, um, you know, I've written a lot. Most of it's actually still out there on the internet. There might be some suspicion about my thoughts on, on housing, so I want to clarify something right away. I really like housing. <laughs> like it, like it a lot. If there was uh, any ambiguity, actually, I actually live in a house. I own it. Uh, I have a large mortgage I'm trying to pay down. Um, uh, I spent about a decade as a renter. Uh, and, and I've spent about a decade now as a landlord, so I, I could have gotten multiple perspectives on this. Uh, but to kind of start out with a general principle before I were to get into specific, specifics, I mean, to me, I really see shelter as one of the basic and probably most important of human needs. I mean, this fundamentally is about trying to get people shelter. You know, we can argue about loan limits and a couple basis points here and there, but at the end of the day, the concern really is, are we putting people in homes? And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. Um, and so for me, I've always long thought that the most important and pressing need uh, is not, you know, again, how do we get somebody a better mortgage, but again, those who lack homes altogether. You know, we have to make sure we're doing our triage the right way. Uh, and so a lot of my time on the Senate banking, for instance, was on mortgage finance. Uh, you know, I'll remind folks, we took like five years to actually get HERA done. Um, but I'm also very proud to say the last thing that I worked on that became law was a reauthorization of McKinney-Vento. And again, remembering uh, that we really do need to focus on those most in need uh, and focus a little less on those who are going to be able to buy anyway. Uh, so I, I do, then again, that, that to me is really the focus I carry with it, uh, which is one of the reasons I want to start out talking to me, those most in need today uh, across the country are those who are still dealing with the destruction in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Texas, and Florida. And our housing agenda right off 
is those areas and that focus uh, and getting back to the road to recovery. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's going to be a long journey ahead, uh, but that really is our focus. As you know, Puerto Rico has some very unique challenges. Um, I'm delighted to say, however, that I, I feel like we've got a great team together. Finally, after we got Pam Patton out, uh, confirmed, I think as many of you know, Pam, she was HUD's lead response to both uh, Katrina and Rita. She's been through this. Uh, I think she's a very steady hand. She's also serving as HUD's chair of disaster management group. Uh, and really trying to make sure that we can take care of the families that are displaced from this, get them to the interim habitable housing. Uh, we're very, you know, watching the situation there and aware that a tremendous amount of housing in Puerto Rico is not habitable currently. Uh, and how do you deal with that situation? So again, I want to say that is our first focus is, re is recovery and dealing with that. Uh, I do want to mention quickly another issue that I spent a tremendous amount of time on Capitol Hill on that I had hoped had, had fixed long ago, but is not. And, and that's, of course, uh, any long-term recovery has to deal with the sustainable flood insurance program. It's probably like everybody's second favorite topic after GSA reform, flood insurance reform. Um, but you know, if there's one lesson I take away from the financial crisis is that when market participants don't face the true cost of their actions, they often make poor decisions. Uh, and again, I can't think of a more area where that, that's more impactful than flood insurance, where we have repeatedly uh, distorted the price of risk. Uh, and unfortunately, many people have moved into harm's way who would not otherwise. Uh, so I think, again, getting the price of that right is incredibly important. Uh, and trying to make sure we get to a premium structure over time uh, that discourages building in disaster prone areas. Because again, this is not just putting property at risk, it's putting lives at risk uh, in a way that incentivizes people to make decisions that, that end up harming themselves and, and harming the overall economy. Um, so again, I, I think as you're aware, the flood insurance programs will be authorized to December 8th, I believe. Uh, and I think we're hopeful that we can get some reforms in place that reduce the vulnerability of the program. And again, not just the vulnerability of the program uh, fiscally, but the vulnerability uh, of areas that are flood, that are flood prone. Uh, and again, to me, I think there's no better way we can mitigate the adverse impacts of the mispricing than to bring a lot more transparency uh, to decision makers, to homeowners, to renters, uh, to developers in terms of what the flood risks that they face are. Uh, one of the things I think I also took away from the, the storm, uh, certainly had been following Puerto Rico issues for a long time before the storm, and I think one of the things that we've learned is that uh, economically vibrant areas are better able to withstand disasters. And so trying to build that base uh, in the future. So I'm going to say our recovery for Puerto Rico is not just going to be about getting people back into housing, but how do you bring some additional vibrancy to the Puerto Rico economy so that, again, we know, unfortunately, what are pa weather patterns are what they are. Puerto Rico will be hit again in the future. How do we make sure there's a more resilient economy there underneath? Uh, I would also extend that to that is true for our overall housing market. Uh, we spent a lot of time, I think, in housing circles talking about, well, you know, this change might get us a few basis points here or there. Uh, I do want to remind, uh, you know, especially the economist in the room, I think, will tell you, but remind all of us, ultimately, at the end of the day, what drives the housing market is income and demographics. Uh, and these overwhelm and swamp everything else you think about. Uh, and so to me, the single most important thing I think we could do for the housing market is to sustainably increase the growth rate of the economy to grow incomes is to me single most important thing we could do for the housing market. Not that again, that there are other things we can't do, which I'm gonna talk about, but I think again, economic policy is housing policy. Uh, I think as I'm sure you recall, the recovery from the financial crisis in 2008 was the slowest in the post-World War II period. Of course, economists still debate whether financial crises always lead to slow recoveries or not. Uh, personally, I think a number of policy changes were made that made the recovery weaker than it would have been otherwise. Uh, and that led to me two forces that really were drags. One was the decline in labor force participation, and the other one was the extremely weak growth in productivity. And ultimately, I'll remind you, population growth, productivity, labor force participation, that is it. That is what drives economic growth. Everything else is basically irrelevant. And you have to drive those factors. Again, I re recognize easier said than done, but at least I think starting out with the basic principles of where you want to focus. Let me certainly say, uh, you know, certainly, and I, I don't blame uh, Sam uh, or, or, or Frank for this for the 20 years I've known them, but I didn't have any gray hair when I met those guys. Um, and the reason I raised, I'm not sure Sam might have had hair when we met. I'm not sure if I'm responsible for him losing that. But uh, that said, um, where this is a roundabout way of saying I recognize that a good part of the a large part of the decline in labor force participation is because we're getting older. Uh, and that's certainly an inevitable part of it. But I will also emphasize demographics is not all of it. My friends at CEA and have done a little bit of research on this. And, you know, my uh, baseline is that I think that 
the labor force participation rate is at least two percentage points lower than it would be with the right policy set of policy changes. So that's where I see is kind of a goalpost. To kind of tell you what that translates into in the job market, that's another three million jobs that I think we can get off the sidelines in terms of workers back in the labor force. And of course, as you know, jobs really are the biggest driver behind the housing market. So I think another three million jobs, both in the housing construction industries as well as demand for housing, could make a really big difference at the end of the day. Uh, and I really take, you know, my job number one is how do we think about increasing labor force participation? You know, obviously the headline unemployment numbers suggest a tight labor market. And of course, you know, for PhDs, that is a tight labor market. Uh, for those maybe without a high school degree, it's not as tight a labor market. So again, helping people get the skill sets they need to bring them back in the labor force, to me, ultimately will help build strength to the housing market. And of course, trying to make sure that some of those skill sets both contribute to increased labor force participation, but also uh, contribute to the labor force that you need to build housing. I certainly have talked to a lot in the building industry uh, where you problems finding the right skill sets. And in fact, a lot of the focus we've had on labor market has really been looking at a number of models. So for instance, in the spring when the president met with the German chancellor, literally 90% of their conversation was about the German apprenticeship market model. And are there things that we can reproduce here to try to build those skill sets with our, with our labor force? Uh, mentioned earlier the particularly weak productivity growth. Uh, and as an economist, I really can't overemphasize this point. Productivity, the single most important source of long run real per capita economic growth is increased productivity. Nothing else really matters. That is it. Um, and obviously that sounds like an abstract, but I do want to remind you, without strong productivity growth, you cannot, you will not have strong wage growth, you will not have strong income growth, and ultimately if you don't have strong wage income growth, you will not have a strong housing market. Uh, and so again, I want to emphasize moving that dial on productivity, uh, I think is incredibly important. I'll just remind you some of the numbers since 2007. Annual productivity growth has been just over 1%. That's half of its post-World War II historic level. Uh, it's actually fallen to even half of that since 2011. Uh, and so you've really had this very sluggish productivity growth, what is constrained wages, constrained income. And again, to me, held back not only the, not only the housing market, but the rest of the economy. So again, let me emphasize productivity growth Labor force participation, those are jobs number one, uh, which productivity growth particularly leads me to, uh, I know one of the more uh, topical issues uh, this week, and that's tax reform. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize, from my perspective, this is not simply about paying less. I guess we'd all like to pay less taxes. Uh, but fundamentally, this is about how do you have a framework that encourages capital investment by businesses that drives productivity? And that is the, the, the objective. Um, outside of the residential construction, if you look at non-residential investment, it has essentially been net zero the last decade. We've essentially replaced what has depreciated. And again, if you don't have that investment, you're not going to have wage growth. Uh, my friend and colleague, CEA Chair Kevin Hassett, estimated that the proposed framework will increase median wages by at least $4,000 annually. That is the effect from capital investment driving productivity. Uh, and of course, there's an additional at least $1,000 cut uh, that will accrue to the median family. Most of this will come from the increase in the standard deduction. So again, putting those wage that income growth, that wage growth, to me ultimately will add to a considerable amount of power behind the housing market and otherwise. Now, I certainly understand that if we get a, a wage increase of 4,000 or more and get a tax of 1,000 or more, you know, families are gonna spend that on a number of things. Some of those things very important, like maybe groceries, like maybe healthcare, maybe even a vacation for some people. But I think it's also fair to say some of it will be spent on uh, mortgage payments and some of it's gonna be spent on rent. And of course, as much as housing and rent make up, a, make up of the typical family budget, I think a fair amount of that increase is ultimately gonna end up in the housing market. Uh, I've heard some suggest, I won't call them out and name on pick of them, that our tax framework might be anti-home ownership. And in my opinion, I think it couldn't be anything further from the truth. Uh, let me talk about why I think that is and, and, and why I think that that's not the case. Uh, of course, a lot of the debate has focused on the, stubble, the doubling of the standard deduction, which of course obviously would encourage fewer houses to, households to itemize and hence fewer to claim the mortgage interest deduction. I don't think there's any debate with that. Um, but I first will remind you, of course, that the mortgage interest deduction is not going away. Anybody can continue to itemize. The question is why they would not itemize this is because they would be better off. That is more money in their pocket from not itemizing. Uh, anybody who'd be better off to itemize would still choose to itemize. So first I want to just emphasize this is not leaving any of these families worse off. Uh, I'll also remind you, I think as most of the economists in the room remember, but I, unfortunately I think a lot of other people do not, 
The research overwhelmingly demonstrates that the mortgage interest deduction does nothing to increase the ownership rate. This isn't a debate among economists. To ask any random economist to read you the research literature on the mortgage interest deduction, it does not increase the homeownership rate. There are even a handful of studies that suggest the mortgage interest deduction decreases the homeownership rate. But again, in fairness, bulk of the evidence is there is no evidence for the mortgage interest deduction driving the homeownership rate. So again, to me, if you were to see a much larger percent of the population uh, take the standard deduction itemize, that's not going to have an impact uh, on homeownership via less use of the mortgage interest deduction. Also remind you, and I'll apologize ahead of time for getting a little wonky for a second if I haven't already, uh, but I'll remind you that economists believe the tax code favors home ownership not because of the mortgage interest reduction, but because the imputed rent for owners, that is the rent you could pay yourself, is untaxed. Whereas we, the tax code, of course, taxes rent as a rental income. I'll remind you the tax framework does nothing to change the non-taxation of imputed rent. So that benefit, which economists across the board identify as the tax benefit favoring home ownership, remains and is unchanged. Um, some have also suggested the elimination of state and local taxes would adversely uh, impact home ownership. Again, in my view, that's false. First, let me remind you that both owners and renters can deduct their state and local taxes. The elimination of such would be similar across the board. There are no differences in tenure impact. Uh, I know a number of you over time have looked at the distribution of benefits for the mortgage interest deduction and, and recognized how skewed that is. Uh, if you think that is skewed, one thing I would uh, suggest you do as a little exercise is take a look at the distribution of the state and local tax benefit. You look at uh, New York State, for instance, where literally almost half of the value of the state and local tax deduction is quite literally claimed by millionaires. This is not something that predominantly goes to the middle class. In fact, 90% of the value of the state and local tax deduction for New York State is taken by filers with over $100,000 in, in adjusted income. So again, this is not a benefit that goes predominantly to the middle class or even minorly to the middle class. So I want to make the radical suggestion that even without the state and local tax deduction, that millionaires are probably still going to buy homes. I think it's going to happen. Uh, I'll remind you additionally uh, that elimination of the state and local tax deduction is one of the most important avenues for making the tax code more progressive. You want to stick it to millionaires, there's no better way to do it than to eliminate state and local tax deduction. Uh, so again, as you know, those deductions predominantly benefit those at the top. And of course, I would argue that essentially if what you're doing on the personal side is eliminating deductions that predominantly benefit those at the top who are going to buy homes anyhow, and buy large homes, most likely, and use that to cut taxes for those in the middle who are in the margin of homeownership. If anything, you will increase the homeownership rate rather than reduce it. So I think for, if likely, when you do the real analysis, the full analysis, a holistic analysis, that the changes on the individual side will be pro-homeownership and pro-housing rather than claims to the contrary. Now, of course, uh, some of the important contributions that you can make towards strengthening the economy on the tax side, there are also a number of things in the mortgage market side. I know that's a lot of interest in the audience. So let me turn to uh, some of those topics on the mortgage side. Uh, foremost, I, I think, is trying to reevaluate the regulatory environment facing the mortgage industry. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the post Dodd Frank regulatory regime disproportionately discourages private capital from taking mortgage credit risk and drives that risk directly onto the taxpayer. Uh, to be blunt and maybe not so generous, I've never quite understood the logic behind the argument that the best way to protect the taxpayer from risky lending is to make sure that all risky lending is only takes place in entities backed by the taxpayer. Strikes me, always has struck me as kind of circular. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize the foremost objective of mortgage finance reform is to reduce the risk to the taxpayer. That is certainly my opinion where I think we should be coming from. I'll remind you that Fannie and Freddie essentially have no capital for all intents and purposes. Modest decline in the housing market could result in the injection of billions of taxpayer dollars. If it's not clear, I'm a guy who thinks prices go up and go down. Cross my fingers and hope that they don't go down until after my watch, but they will go down again. And I think we need to have a mortgage finance system that takes into consideration that you will have cyclical effects in the housing market and not one based upon the dream of ever increasing prices. Uh, I'll also remind you, in addition to Fannie and Freddie, FHA backs over a trillion, uh, half of which, in my opinion, is subprime quality. Even in today's relatively strong housing market, FHA has about $40 billion in seriously delinquent mortgages, $40 billion in seriously delinquent mortgages. Uh, were prices to flatten or decline, those numbers would skyrocket. So I would argue, and again, I think this is beyond arguing, quite frankly, that the taxpayer is more exposed to the mortgage market today than in 2008 or ever. 
Um, let me emphasize, this is not a healthy situation for anybody. It's not a healthy situation for the taxpayer, obviously. I don't think it's a healthy situation for the real estate industry. Just as Dodd-Frank was a reaction, overreaction, I would say, in some sense, to the bank bailouts, I fear that another rescue of the mortgage market could result in extremely harmful regulatory backlash that would do substantial harm to our real estate and mortgage market. So I think it is definitely in the interest of everyone in the room to avoid these bailouts in the first place. Because, the, again, the backlash will not be pretty. Uh, ultimately, a housing market less dependent on federal support, in my opinion, will be a more stable housing market. Uh, I think one thing that will increase stability is more certainty in the legal rules. Uh, while, of course, and I think you've heard HUD Secretary uh, Carson talk about this, we were reevaluating uh, the impact of the False Claims Act as it relates to FHA. Uh, but I also want to emphasize we'll be reexamining the uncertainty generated by the qualified mortgage rule as well as the residential qualified mortgage rule. Uh, I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind, under the QN, any defect in a mortgage could be a bar to foreclosure. We don't know today what a material defect is in terms of the QN. And unfortunately, we're not really going to find out until the next housing market downturn. So unsurprisingly, if lenders are unsure of their ability to foreclose, they will be a lot less willing to offer mortgages to borrowers with a higher likelihood of default. And that is where we are today. Uh, additionally, such uncertainty will and has increased the amount of paperwork and compliance that goes into mortgage lending, which has resulted in an almost doubling in the cost of originating a mortgage. And as we know all too painfully, these costs are largely passed along to the borrower. Uh, regulatory uncertainty has also driven up the cost not only of origination, but also dramatically the cost of servicing. Again, we should not forget these costs are ultimately borne by the consumer. No amount of wishful thinking is going to change that. These costs aren't coming out of Wall Street bonuses. They're coming out of the pockets of middle American families, uh, and they're being born, and that's, I think, that have a, have a detrimental impact on mortgage demand. So if Dodd-Frank's mortgage provision had actually addressed the, the causes of the crisis or brought finance increase, increased financial stability or even increased access to credit, I might feel that it'd be worth the costs. Uh, but in my opinion, unfortunately, I, think, I do not believe these rules do so. I think they ignore the largest drivers of default, which are ultimately borrower credit quality and borrower equity. Uh, they greatly increase the cost of the process, and even worse, the taxpayers more exposed than ever. Uh, it's hard to think of any party that actually wins, with the exception of the trial lawyers who are going to win from the litigation that the QM and QM are going to create during the next downturn. So again, it's a bad situation for the taxpayer, bad situation for the borrower, bad situation for the lender. And I think that needs a complete rethink. Uh, the Treasury Department in June laid out a number of proposed regulatory changes to the mortgage radiation service processing. I think those proposals would be a great place to start to try to bring uh, the cost, to reduce the cost of the process. Uh, I think that those proposals also do so with no increased risk of financial stability are the taxpayer. So I think that they're pretty straightforward. Uh, I think that they're pretty clear cut. Uh, and then I do want to emphasize this is a, it's not necessarily about always changing the rules as it is about bringing clarity to the rules. I mean, I can't remember more than 10 years ago ever having heard the term regulation by enforcement. You know, as you know, I came from the Cato Institute. I believe in the rule of law. I think borrowers, lenders, you should all know what side of the line you're on. It should not be some guessing game where you get sued in an enforcement action against you, and that's how you figure out what the law is. That, to me, and again, you know, a lot of the emphasis in the PHH case focused on the, the, the structure of the CFPB. What I think people really missed was the very basic due process considerations. So I will admit I as ascribe to the very radical notion that even financial service providers are entitled to due process. No, it's radical. Uh, so again, to me, fundamental question facing the mortgage and housing market, how do we move in the direction of reducing the damage to our economy and financial system from these periodic swings? And, I, and, I, and again, I think we have to kind of keep that in mind. Central to this objective, in my opinion, is increasing market discipline imposed upon participants. Uh, there are perhaps no economy, of the, no sectors of the economy I can think of more characterized and moral hazard by the, than the mortgage market and the housing market. Uh, and I know you're going to hear from the next panel on supply side challenges. I haven't talked a lot about this because these are predominantly state and local issues, but I do think these are incredibly important of critical importance. Uh, and I think, quite frankly, if we could fix that at the state and local level, that'd be more important than almost anything we could do at the federal level. Uh, as an economist and a student of housing markets, one issue that gives me considerable concern is that I think, if anything, the supply of housing is more inelastically supplied than ever. Uh, and certainly in the post-crisis environment, the direction among local governments has been to add restrictions to supply, not reduce them. Uh, and I'm sure as we all remember for our Econ 101 classes, a more inelastic supply curve means that similar shifts in demand will have even greater swings in price than they would otherwise. So again, when people say, oh, well, prices will never go down because supply is tight, it's just the opposite. The tighter supply is, the more magnitudes of demand are shifted in the prices. 
and we should all be very concerned about that. So uh, I'm not necessarily one to necessarily make predictions, but I feel comfortable in saying without substantial changes in the supply structure of housing, price volatility in the long run over the future will be considerably greater than it's been in the past. And that represents tremendous risk to borrowers, to financial stability, to the economy in general. So uh, again, we haven't fixed these issues. Uh, and to me, that really is probably the biggest outstanding risk in the housing market that really concerns me. So as not to end on a rather depressing note, <laughs> I do want to observe that uh, we have seen sustained growth in the labor market the last couple of years. We've seen sustained growth in business investment that's got better, particularly last quarter was very strong turnaround in business investment. Uh, consumer and business confidence is up. So uh, again, to me, I think the problem, one of the problems we fundamentally made in the past in the mortgage market was really to substitute credit growth for income growth. And the positive is I think we've started to see some real income growth in the last couple of years that will try to kind of help carry the housing market along. Prices are still outpacing incomes, but at least it's the, the gap is, has narrowed a little bit. So I do think we've got a better foundation, but I do also think that there are a number of unaddressed issues uh, that if we don't address will come back and haunt us and be quite costly. So uh, apologies about ending on a, on a, on a down note, but again, I, I think the urgency of these issues uh, means that we really do need to kind of pay a focus and an attention on them. So I know we've got a, a little bit of time for questions. Five minutes. Yes. Uh, I, there's a big old microphone coming right to you. Hi, I'm Nick Cole. I'm a teacher I agree with many of the things that you just raised, but I do have one question about QM. How do we reconcile the fact that we are back at record bank profitability for large banks and also for our community banks with these QM attacks? <laughs> Well, so there's a couple of factors there. The interest rate environment is actually quite favorable to banks. Once you start to see, and I remind you, we've already seen at least three rate increases. Um, the increase in the lending has gone up faster than the cost of funds for banks. So that's actually impacted the profitability. But the reason they've gotten around a lot of the QM costs is they've passed it along. So as you know, there's a patch if you sell to Fannie Freddie, there's a patch if you sell to VA, FHA. So essentially, the way the lenders have made a considerable amount of money on this is, they have made the fee income and the actual credit risk is flowing to the taxpayer. So that's why they're making a consumer money on this. Also say as an aside while, while I had remembered it, uh, a couple of studies that looked at the mortgage interest reduction estimated that about a third of the value of the mortgage interest reduction is actually captured by the lender, uh, not captured by the borrower. And of course, most of the rest of it is not captured by the borrower anyhow, but captured by the home seller, depending on the supply elasticity of the local market. Um, but ultimately, the reason why you've seen these record profits is predominantly the macro interest rate environment. But again, because the credit, they're not keeping the credit risk. And I, and I think, uh, funny, we want a world where we want a world where lenders are willing to take credit risk, and, and we're not in that world today. Uh, over here. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, what do you think the solution is then to the conservatorship of Fannie and Freddie? If you want to bring private, more private capital in, how, how do you get there? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I, I, I had been waiting for eight years for Jim to kind of tell me the answer to that, uh, and he just passed it on to us. So, uh, so let me first say um, we're committed to making sure that Fannie and Freddie are not handed over in conservatorship to the next administration. Um, but I do want to emphasize uh, as you've noticed in my discussions about tax and other things, we've only really now begun the process of figuring out what is the exit path. Uh, so I put it this way, if it was easy to get out of, get Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship, it would have been done already. So uh, again, finding the path forward is a process that we're just beginning. Uh, for those of you who either were involved in the Dodd-Frank reforms or in the uh, listening sessions or in the tax listening sessions, we are at some point in the future going to do a number of listening sessions where we bring in stakeholders to, to hear, you know, what's the various plans for getting out of conservatorship, what's the various plans for bringing private capital. I will emphasize again, following off the last question, um, to me, the regulatory litigation risks from QM and QRM are so great that if you're going to make anything that looks like a risky loan, you're unwilling to do that without the government guarantee. So number one in this needs to be a fix to QM and QRM. Because that's private capital is just not, I mean, and, and again, as I emph emphasized, we don't know what material risks would be a bar to foreclosure. How do you price that? I mean, I, I don't even know how you'd price that credit because it's not just an issue of here's the FICO, here's the down payment. It's also the litigation and regulatory risk that fits into this that are very difficult to price. So again, first, fix the regulatory structure. 
so that you no longer disincentivize private capital. Uh, but the other piece of it is trying to figure out how to create a glide path to, to get them out. Um, but I will emphasize there's been no, there's no decision on this is the model, that's the model. We're, we've just now beginning the process is the short answer. Yes. It's the benefit of being up front. That's all the questions. So Nikita Trebelli again, CRO. So we have this scenario where when private capital dominated in the market, it was in a mostly unregulated market. Um, so we've gone from no regulation to good regulation that's sensible and bright line, in our opinion, for lenders and consumers alike. What is it that, what's the middle? Okay. So without relitigating the crisis, I'll just say some of the premises of the question are, are not shared by me respectfully. Uh, I think, I don't think we ever, you know, certainly have not had a wild west in mortgage lending in my lifetime uh, and never had an unregulated sector. Um, all that said, uh, I think you can decide what the rules, of the, my, so my biggest complaint would be, let's decide what the rules are and make them clear. I mean, I mean again, let's decide what is a bar to foreclosure under QM. All of this guidance and enforcement by, you know, regulation by enforcement, that is not the appropriate way. Uh, to, to, to run a regulatory environment. Do a rulemaking, do notice and comment. Um, I'm sure if I asked everybody in the room what, their, what the definition of abusive was under Dodd-Frank, you'd give me a different, every single person would give me a different answer. You should not have to hire a, a team of lawyers to tell you what the law is. Uh, one lawyer should be sufficient to read it when it's clear. So again, I think we should all kind of get together and agree on, okay, what are the standards we're trying to achieve? And let's actually write that out and clarify it rather than an after the fact gotcha, which is the regulatory environment we have today that doesn't benefit anybody, in my opinion. Um, but that said, I think we can come up with a middle ground. I think that's what we're looking for is a middle ground where you have access, but you have accountability. Uh, you have a much smaller footprint for the taxpayer, but you have some of that there. Uh, and again, you have some more market discipline to complement the regulatory structure that's there. So again, I'm, I think getting there to that middle ground is where we wanna be. And I certainly should emphasize, uh, nobody, not myself or anybody that I talk to on a daily basis in the EOB wants to go back to pre-2008. I've yet yet to meet that person. Yes. Hi, Mark. So I want to piggyback on the, uh, the QM question. Um, I'm one of the people, full exposure, who helped to draft Dodd-Frank uh, and worked on the QM and QRM provisions of the law. Uh, and so the, those provisions of the law were a result of sort of delicate balances, dances if you will, between the industry and civil rights groups and consumer protection uh, groups. And so they, they represent a compromise, if you will, a compromise position uh, where there was a lot of vetting of the different provisions of um, those provisions of the law. And then of course, when the rules were <coughs> introduced, uh, there were, uh, was a lot of back and forth in terms of people submitting comments and, and presenting their positions. So I'm just wondering, and as you well know, Mark, sure. I hold the same view that Nikitra holds, that there were lots of um, fraud and there was a lot of abuse in uh, the lending market, particularly on the private side um, in the subprime market. So how do you how do you how how do you address that particular issue that QM and QRM are the result of a lot of compromises between the industry, the investors, and for, uh, from civil rights and consumer protection groups? I, you know, I appreciate that. Cer certainly should say. First of all, that I'm definitely the belief that there was lots of fraud and abuse pre-crisis. That's, I mean, you get that when you get a lack of market discipline, uh, almost inevitably. Um, so, first of all, I'll remind folks, and I think the the video is still up there of Barney, of Congressman Barney Frank appearing before the Financial Services Committee a few years ago and saying QM QRM did not work out the way he intended. So, it, if Barney thinks it's not worked, then I think maybe we should probably listen to that. Uh, I recognize, I do remember all that back and forth. I remember where the rule started out, where it ended up. Uh, I do remember the concerns with that. Uh, I think if it was not, me, sure. Part of the reason why we are where we are with respect to QRM and QRM is because the industry insisted on having the ability to have Understood. So that's part of the reason why we are where we are with respect to QRM and QRM. 
reason why we are where we are. So my question is, and how do you? So there are. So it? I certainly appreciate some bright lines that were put in it, uh, and to me, what I think you is, so there are some things that are not bright line that are still in the statute. That's been an unwillingness. I mean, we still again don't know what abusive means, and that's beyond QM. That's a separate issue. Uh, I think, but you know, I, I'll put it this way. It's interesting to me that a lot of people who defend QM, if I immediately suggest that we apply QM as written to Fannie, Freddie, and FHA, there's there's something like, oh, well, wait now. Well, if it's great, then why isn't it great for everybody? That's what I struggle to figure out. Um, so again, and you know, I think it's fair to say I have repeatedly heard from lenders of the last few years that if it wasn't for the QM patch on Fannie and Freddie, we wouldn't have a mortgage market today. I have been told that repeatedly. So either those people are lying to me. Are they wrong? Are they right? And the QM is wrong. So I'm trying to figure out which one it is. I'm open to any of these possibilities. But to me, I think it's untenable to have a QM for this part of the market and the rest of the market not be subject to it. So the end game should be, if we're going to have a QM, it is a uniform QM that applies to every single mortgage everybody makes. And if we can't live with that outcome, then we need to rethink QM. Again, I'm a rule of law due process guy. I'm not for one set of rules for this person, another set of rules for this person. I'm for everybody gets the same rules, everybody gets the same playing field, everybody gets the same chances. And what the current structure of QM, direct violation of that. So I'm, I'm delighted, you know, at least I'm happy to, to work with you guys to figure out how do you come up with a QM that's workable. But again, to me, um, we should either apply it as is to Fannie, Freddie, FHA, or, or, or we should change it. And, and let's have that conversation. But it's. Absolutely, to me, undeniable that the current structure QM, QRM drives lending to Fannie and Freddie FHA. I think that's just beyond dispute. Um, and so if, if we're, and, and given that is the worst lender on the worst day has more capital than that, that greatly concerns me in terms of the taxpayer and financial stability. So again, trying to level that playing field I think is the utmost importance. But again, I'm not dismissive of all the work that went into the QM, um, but again, if. We need, we need to make sure it applies to everybody and, and applies fairly. I'll come right back to you if there's nobody else. <laughs> okay, well, Jim. So what's the process for So right now, we're, we are where we are. We are. The way CFPB has defined QM and they, in essence, through the patch, sort of punted it to the way the underwriting works at FHA and, and the GSEs. Um, so in some sense, it's a, uh, uh, if one assumes that you get GSE reform or FHA reform, it's a, um, it's a punt to, a, yep. to, to future policymakers um, who will have to decide um, within uh, the GSE channel uh, and you know, potentially even the FHA channel what um, a more prescriptive looking QM looks like. Process-wise, what do you guys do as an administration to affect that outcome? Do you wait on a CFPB director who's more sympathetic? Do you go to Congress? What, what are the next So there's, a, there's a, a number of different avenues, and, and as you touched upon, I mean, obviously, uh, Director Watt is there for at least another year. Uh, obvi obviously, Director Cordray is there at least till July. Um, so what we can do on the regulatory front for some of the players is certainly limited. Uh, I am hopeful that in whatever is done in Congress on mortgage finance reform includes a regulatory package. Uh, and my understanding is at least some of the conversations that Crapo has had and some of the conversations that Pennsylvania have had have talked about various QM fixes. So now, I, I'm certainly the belief that if you originate and hold it and keep it on portfolio, a safe harbor from QM strikes me as relatively reasonable, especially since where we got at the end of the day was QM equaling QRM, which of course, as Barney Frank has reminded us, was never the intention. Um, but that said, we are where we are, uh, and how do you back your way out of that? So, more, so any sort of Dodd-Frank reform that comes out of the Hill, any sort of um, mortgage finance reform should have regulatory fixes attached to it. Again, to me, it's got to be holistic. Can't be just be about Fannie and Freddie. It's got to be about the entire mortgage market and how that fits together. Uh, that said, the one part that we could control, and we'll have an FHA commissioner at some point, is taking a look at FHA and how do we make sure that we can. FHA was supposed to be a little more QM compliant. That's certainly one thing that we do control and we'll look at. Same with VA, same with the rural housing loans. Uh, so we're gonna try to deal with the pieces that we have control over without unduly, we certainly don't wanna disrupt the market, but to bring us to a glide path where everybody is eventually operating under the same set of rules. So again, it's, it's a, this is a 2018, 2019 process given the turnover and appointees and given the time frame of Congress. So you know, again, I, I wanna emphasize none of this is gonna happen anytime soon. So I'll let you have the last question. Oh, she's got the microphone. There you are. Right beside. 
Yeah. I'll shift the questioning a little bit. We talked this morning about addressing discrimination and mortgage lending. Have you all thought about ways that we could address discrimination and mortgage lending um, so that we could have that level playing field that you mentioned? Uh, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. So we only have our assistant secretary in recently. We don't have a number of people in other agencies. So we've had initial conversations about starting the process. If, I'm sure Jim would be happy to regale you sometime with how the processes, the PCCs and the DPCs and the prints. Jim will be happy to walk you through how that process works internally. Needless to say, we're at the beginning of that process rather than the end. Uh, so I know it feels like, I mean, I can certainly say that the more than 10 months I've been there feel like a long time, but it's also important to keep in mind there's still a lot of place, put, people being put into place. Uh, and until you have all those positions filled, you really can't drive the train on anything differently. So again, what I would say at the end of the day on the mortgage stuff, on the housing stuff, immediate focus is on devastated areas. The longer term focus, which is really gonna be 2018, 2019, will sped beyond that. So what I would end with saying is have a little patience. But, uh, thank you, I hope you had enjoyed the lunch, if not the comments. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I know the... Thank you. by Dr. Calabria, but we're going to go right into some of the supply issues. They're uh, waving at you. <laughs> some sound issues. Am I good? I know. After lunch. I don't understand the hand signals from the back of the room. Okay, folks, thanks. We're going to keep on going with the program here this afternoon. I'm Rolf Pendall. Uh, I co-direct the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute, and I'm really delighted to be here uh, with you to, uh, to take you through the, the dozy part of the, uh, of the program. <laughs> I hope you got lots of carbs so that you can really have a challenge. Um, no, actually, we're going to try to really keep things uh, moving right along uh, in, this, uh, in this session. Uh, what I'm going to do is this. We're going to do a, a first round of a maximum of five minutes each for our speakers. I will introduce them in turn. And each of them is going to talk about a significant supply constraint or two that they think are really important today uh, in, uh, in, in the current uh, affordability situation, which, as you all know, um, is pretty critical. Uh, then I'm going to go back to them. Uh, to engage with each other for a round. Uh, and then in the third round, uh, I'm going to do a lightning round. Okay, so I'm going to have a question for them in a lightning round. And so if we do this right, uh, and I'm going to say at the end of the five, the five minutes for everybody, I'm just going to politely say time uh, so that uh, all our speakers will know that it's time to go on to the next. We can get lots of issues out on the table. We'll have more in that second round. 
uh, and some solutions from the federal side uh, on the supply uh, constraints. Uh, and then there should be plenty of time for questions, emphasize questions, not your answers, your questions, their answers, hopefully. Um, but if you have answers of your own, of course, then we are, we've exhausted the panel. We're happy to, uh, to hear that. The full bios are in your packets, so I invite you and direct you to uh, read your packets. Um, but uh, let me start out by uh, welcoming and thanking Sam Cater, my uh, uh, collaborator in putting the, the panel together, and uh, our collaborator at CoreLogic. He's the Deputy Chief Economist at CoreLogic, uh, and he's going to kick us off this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Rolf, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you. I've got a few uh, slides that um, I'd like to go through. Uh, three main points from the slides. Uh, the first is that inventory is tighter than it appears. Um, oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, inventory is tighter than it appears. It's much lower for entry-level buyers. Second point, the tight uh, supply in the lower and uh, middle priced range of homes is really driving up home prices in, in the lower and middle end, much more so than the higher end. Um, and the third point is we've got an oncoming wave of millennial entry level home buyers that will be hitting their 30s in the next few years, and there's no supply for these folks to, to, to purchase. So the first point, inventory is tighter than it appears. It's much lower for entry level buyers. So here I've broken up. So you know, traditionally, when you look at inventory to sales ratios, which is what, what this is, uh, it, it combines the high end and the low end. So what I've done here is, 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 is break out the supply into the entry level supply, um, which is sort of in that yellow box. And the, and the price tiers on the bottom, that refers to, I've got you know, all various markets. I've got, I've got expensive markets and affordable markets. So I didn't want to use prices, so I used price tiers. So what the 100 mean, means is that's the median priced home in that market. To give you a sense of what that means, in the DC area, the median priced home is about 400,000. Um, so that entry level supply uh, bucket um, represents prices in the DC area between 200,000 and 500,000. So that gives you a sense of sort of what I'm talking about here. And the month supply for uh, those homes is running at about two and a half to three months compared to the overall month supply rate of uh, a little over four months supply. So it's much lower for the middle and entry uh, level borrowers. And keep in mind that a four month supply is actually quite tight. Uh, when we look at the housing market uh, over the longer term, a six month supply rate is really what's sort of uh, normal. And so, uh, and, and not, not only is it really tight, is it still getting tighter? You can see in, in 17, um, in August of 17, it's, it's lower than a, than a year ago. So uh, what's the impact of this? So, you, know, for, you know, first question is, well, you know, Sam, this doesn't look like a big difference. It's only a couple months. What, is that really a big deal? It actually is a huge deal. And so uh, this slide really illustrates that. So here I've got a cross section of, of, uh, of markets. And, I've, and on the left hand side, I've got the uh, list price to final price uh, premium or discount. Y usually it's a, it's a discount, right? You, let's say you list your home at 200,000. And, but you really expect to sell it for 190, um, and, and so it sells at a, at a discount. And you can see on the on the x-axis, I've got the month supply. So between about six uh, six months and ten months, the discount doesn't change that much. It's re really not a huge difference. Once it starts dipping below five and four, you start generating price increases. Right, the discount shrinks. Once you get down to about three months, and then down to the two and a half months, you get that pop. Um, where some of these markets, the the entire market is selling above. What, what the list price is. This is generating huge amounts of price increases. And the bulk of this lack of supply is in the, is, is in the uh, lower and middle end of the distribution. And we can see that in home prices. So here I've broken out the year over year change in home prices for the top 20, uh, 20 markets for the low tier, which means it's at the 75, 75th percentile or below uh, for that market. And then for the high tier, which means it's at 120, at the 125th percentile or more. So for example, in the DC market, again, the median price is about 400,000. So the high tier represents 500K and above, and the low tier represents uh, 300K and below. And so you can see in, in each of the, the largest 20 markets in the US, low end home prices are appreciating at a much faster clip than, than high end uh, prices. And this is not just a recent from, from phenomenon. This is a 12 month year over year change uh, in, in home prices for the low versus higher tier. This is really a much longer term story. This has been happening for the last two and a half decades. 
So here I've plotted the, the entry level prices, the low end tier in, in the red back in 1976, and I've, I've indexed it to one. And then I've done the same thing for uh, high, end, uh, high end prices. You can see that uh, in, over the last 40 years, high end prices are up about sevenfold. Low end or entry level prices are up 15 fold. Huge differences. And this has been happening over the last 20 uh, years or so. Also, notice what's happened in the last 10 years. On the high end, home prices are <coughs> almost back to where they were in the peak back in uh, 2006, whereas on the low end, home prices are already 15% above the peak. <laughs> Lastly, I want to just shift to, to, the, to the, de the demand side of the equation. Uh, here, I've plotted the number of uh, folks by uh, age cohort. So the way you read this chart is that we've got about 4.3 million 21-year-olds uh, in the US. Uh, the peak age cohort, peak millennial, um, is uh, at about 4.7 million. Those are 26-year-olds. That's the biggest age cohort ever uh, in, 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 the, in the US. And then it, it drops down from there. On the right-hand side, I've plotted the purchase uh, using our purchase, purchase application uh, data. It covers about a third of the market, a third of Humda applications. So here, I've, I've plotted the purchase applications per 1,000 persons in each of those age brackets. So it's sort of a, a peak, uh, or it's sort of a, uh, it's their, their, their purchase demand adjusted for the number of folks uh, in that age category. And that peak demand for purchase occurs between 30 and about 37, 38 years old. So you can see we are clearly six years away from peak demand for millennials, and the supply is not there. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, next, we'll hear from Michael uh, Neal. Michael is the Assistant Vice President for Forecasting and Analysis at the National Association of Home Builders. Thanks uh, for being us. No, being thank you, Ralph. Um, that, that's a great way. Uh, this, is, this is a great segue to piggyback on, uh, on my comments. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the dimensions along which we are, our builders tell us that they are experiencing uh, these challenges. Um, we think about them in terms of uh, labor, lots, building materials, regulations, and then we've seen an emerging issue on the uh, supply side of the financing equation. Um, you know, we ask our builders on a regular basis, uh, are they experiencing low labor, uh, low labor availability? Uh, when we asked, when we posed this question to our builders in 2011, about one-seventh, about 14% of them said that they were experiencing uh, 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 late, low labor availability. Um, that has increased successively. And uh, as of 2016, um, anywhere between three-fourths and four-fifths of our builders are saying that they are um, experiencing uh, low availability of labor. Um, we try to confirm that uh, with federal government data. Here I'm showing you uh, data from uh, the JOLTS, the job openings um, and labor turnover survey. Uh, you can see that uh, the number of job openings scaled by the number of jobs in the industry are at their cycle peaks. Um, we think on the one hand, this is good news. This is consistent with what the NHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index is telling us, the sentiment of our builders, uh, that there are projects builders want to build, and so there are job openings. Um, but conversely, another way to interpret this is that, well, you know, the job openings are there, but they're having a tough time filling, uh, filling those slots. Um, lots are another issue that our builders continue to tell us that they are uh, a, a, another challenge that our builders are facing. Um, again, we ask our builders um, on a frequent basis uh, whether or not they're experiencing um, low lot supply or, uh, uh, or, or high lot supply. Uh, what's interesting is that typically the answers of our builders uh, in terms of low lot supply, uh, that is the red bars, the majority of builders that are saying there's low lot supply, typically responds to, it responds to broader market conditions. That that is the amount of building in the single family space that we're observing. That is the blue uh, space uh, against which the red bar is juxtaposed against. Um, and that then brings in uh, kind of the contrast that we're seeing in recent years. That is that um, a large proportion of our builders are saying that there's low lot supply um, at a time uh, in which uh, the amount of building has been growing at a much more moderate pace um, and is at levels that we believe are below uh, normality. Building materials, uh, a third issue. Uh, if uh, this is an emerging issue, um, as recently as 2016, uh, fewer than half of our builders um, said that this was a problem that they were facing. Um, but it, it has become uh, an issue uh, more recently. I'm showing uh, uh, price indices, changes in price indices uh, in softwood lumber um, and framing lumber. We have seen marked increases um, both in 2016, kind of the price increases there brought us back to the levels that were prevailing back in 2014, um, and then we've seen additional increases uh, of about 10 to 15 percent uh, in 2017. 
Um, well, part of that increase does reflect some of the actions taken by the Trump administration in terms of uh, the, the, the levy, the tariffs that were levied against uh, Canadian softwood lumber. That is a key source of foreign imports for us. Um, our estimates are that it did have an adverse impact on the average price of a new home. That being said, though, the impact was, uh, was relatively small. We estimated roughly about $1,500 to $1,600 um, increase in the, uh, in, in the average price of a new home. So if the average price of a new home is approximately $300,000 nationwide. Then, yes, we had an adverse effect, but again, um, it, wa it, was, it was small. Um, a third issue uh, is our regulations. Um, these are regulations across all levels of government. Um, you know, we find that uh, regulations account for about a quarter of, uh, uh, of the average price of a new home. That works out to approximately $80,000 on average. Um, you know, again, the, we break it out into uh, the, 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 the regulations that affect actual construction. So those are kind of like the construction codes that are put in place. Um, and then the issues that are occurring at the development phase. So we're talking about the environmental issues, the delay that's associated with uh, submitting a permit. Um, you know, I think the main takeaway here is that we have seen roughly about a 30% increase in uh, the impact over the last five years. Uh, that was the last time that we actually did um, this exercise. Um, and then finally, uh, this, is, uh, this is what we think is an emerging issue. Our builders um, have not necessarily been telling this, but we are beginning to see it in the data. Um, at NHB, we track kind of mortgage financing uh, for sure, but we also track trends on the, uh, on the supply side in terms of construction financing as well. Um, 80 to 90% of our builders tell us that their primary source um, for construction financing are commercial banks. So we kind of pay attention uh, to the FDIC data. Um, uh, 2014 to 2016, we were growing at anywhere between 16 to 18 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. Those are the red bars on this chart. Um, but we have slowed down fairly dramatically um, uh, over uh, uh, the end of 2016 and going into 2017. In fact, the annual growth rates have been roughly cut in half to somewhere around 8 to 9 percent. Uh, we've delved a little deeper, and the slowdowns are really taking place at smaller banks. Um, I think it's important to remember here that you know, residential construction is kind of a lot like farming um, in the sense that it is a small business, um, uh, it is a small business activity um, uh, and a relationship banking kind of activity where smaller businesses are matching with community banks in order to originate the construction financing loan. Uh, that being said, uh, those, the, the smaller banks account for anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of the stock of construction loans held uh, at commercial banks more generally. Um, and so the trends that take place at these community banks um, tend to drive growth rates overall. Um, and so that's what's leading to the slowdown. Uh, if I say one more thing, I think that that is that these are kind of, I think these are kind of a snapshot of the dimensions that we think are playing a role in what's holding back the inventory, um, uh, specifically on the, on the new side. Thanks very much. Uh, next we'll hear uh, from Carlos Martin, who's a senior fellow in my policy center, the Metropolitan Housing Community Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Uh, Carlos, please take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Michael did a great job of summarizing all of the challenges that the, the, on the supply side that we're facing. So I'm just gonna elaborate a little bit on two of those points. The gist of what I'm gonna talk about are uh, describing demographic trends in the workforce, um, in the construction workforce, and globalization trends in the material side, and how those affect the supply side issues that we're seeing. So, Michael pointed already the issue of openings. So, we're up to 300,000 openings in the last count um, in the construction industry. Um, what we also see are that hires and separations have about evened out since about 2011. So if you dig a little bit into the separation side, you see that layoffs have actually gone down, um, not surprising given the need to hire, um, but quits have actually gone up. So for me, this begs the question a little bit about how, um, if we have openings going up and quits going up, how is the industry recruiting um, new workers to come in? Um, how are they rewarding with career advancement? Um, so I'm gonna go through some three demographic trends um, uh, that affect us. The first is the issue of age. So the typical story is that the construction workforce is aging. If you look at the two primary demographic um, gender groups in the construction workforce, it's uh, Hispanic males and non-Hispanic males. We see fairly even age distribution across all of them since uh, um, uh, current, uh, in 2003. Um, with a little bigger bump in the share for younger folks among the Hispanic males. But if you look at 2016, the, percent, the proportional share of non-Hispanic white males that are 55 and over has doubled um, since 2003. 
So age is clearly part of the picture. We, that's uh, something that I think we all have witnessed. So let's talk a little bit about another tradition. This is a, a, a workforce factor. This is the demographics, demographics of race. So this is the worst kept secret, of course, in the construction industry that the vast majority uh, and many occupations uh, in residential construction are Hispanic male. Um, if you look to, just to help understand this graph, the left side are manual labor occupations, um, the proportions from 2003 to 2000, uh, uh, 2007 to 2016 of the Hispanic workforce. So the Hispanic workforce of the general workforce in the United States is about 18% right now. So the top two on the left side are drywallers and roofers. They make up the majority, uh, Hispanic males make up the majority of the construction workforce in those industries. And as you see, if you go back um, to the other columns, the middle one is more supervisorial construction trade. Um, building inspectors, it sort of evens out around the Hispanic proportion of the broader workforce. And on the third, just for fun, for kicks, I included real estate uh, uh, agents and brokers and uh, lenders uh, and uh, credit officers that are sub significantly below. But in either case, what I'm showing is sort of this issue around the current workforce is actually predominantly Hispanic male. Finally, of course, the other corollary story is the issue of foreign, the nativity status of the workforce. We know that about 29% of the construction workforce is foreign born, they're immigrants. Of that, thanks to colleagues from Pew, who I assume are some are in the room, we know that about half of that immigrant workforce is undocumented. So about 13% um, of the whole construction workforce is undocumented. So clearly immigration policy uh, is likely to affect longer term supply side challenges. So very quickly, just to add, um, a micro point of the Canadian tariff, and certainly this is a long-term trend that we've seen. Over the last uh, 10 years, we've been at a deficit in lumber globally. We, uh, we export 6.7% uh, 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 billion uh, dollars, um, excuse me, we import and we export um, uh, a lower portion of that. Canada clearly is the primary culprit, as Michael pointed out. We imported just in 2016 5.6 billion in lumber from Canada and only exported 1.1 billion to it. So clearly we're looking at a globalization in uh, workforce and globalization in materials as being supply side factors. There are a lot of other issues um, that I think we'd like to elaborate on in terms of challenges, but I'm happy to pass it along. Great, thanks very much, Carlos. Um, fourth, we have Stockton Williams. Stockton is executive vice president for content at the Urban Land Institute, uh, and he also is the executive director of the ULI Terwilliger Center for Housing. Stockton, thank you. Thanks, Raul, good afternoon, it's great to be here. I'm not sure, uh, if we've actually put a number or two on the, the supply shortage. But just to maybe frame it, you know, um, National Association of Realtors has said that, you know, we might be something like three million units short uh, of overall uh, demand. Um, and if you look at the folks who have the most serious housing needs, the very low income, the National Low Income Housing Coalition uh, says that there's something like seven million units short in terms of affordable and available units for for people at the bottom of the economic spectrum. So a huge problem, we've heard uh, some of the drivers of it. I'm gonna add yet another uh, to the list, which is uh, local zoning. Um, a great topic for after lunch uh, discussion, but uh, zoning uh, as we know it in this country uh, turned 100 uh, last year, um, uh, marking a century since New York City uh, enacted really the first of the kind of modern local zoning codes. But it was really a, a Supreme Court decision 10 years later in 1926 uh, in a case called Euclid v. Ambler, um, that the, the current approach to zoning as we experience it every day uh, was codified. And that's, you know, in summary that um, the court um, found that there is a public interest in uh, segregating land uses by specific zones. Um, that was fundamentally uh, the, the, the predicate for um, what is now the universal uh, and hyper-local phenomenon uh, of local zoning uh, in the U.S. Interestingly, though, um, at the time of the Euclid uh, v. Ambler decision, uh, the federal government, uh, the Hoover administration, saw an important role for national policy. It actually promulgated uh, model local zoning codes that it uh, delegated down to the states. And in our constitutional system of government, um, unless powers and authority are specifically vested in the federal government, it's actually the state, state governments, uh, who really have the say uh, on what happens. Uh, states really need to delegate uh, to local jurisdictions to do uh, most of what we take uh, for granted as being fundamentally up to local control. 
Uh, but, and we'll get back to that. Um, but in terms of zoning, how do we see uh, zoning playing out uh, in the housing market? We see it in all kinds of ways. Uh, mandatory lot sizes, height limits, parking requirements, prohibitions on certain types of housing, higher density or rental, for example, uh, in, in some areas, are also reflections of how the local zoning power uh, is used um, uh, to define where and how uh, housing is built and where it isn't. Uh, so what do we know about the impact of zoning on housing prices? Uh, great new paper by uh, Vanessa Brown Calder from the Cato Institute, Mark's former organization, uh, just came out and found that in 36 states, local zoning regulations are directly associated with higher housing prices. Uh, recent work by Ed Glazer and Joe Jorko uh, at Harvard uh, looked at the difference between construction costs and home prices from 1950 all the way through to 2013. They found that in the 2010 to 2013 period, the cost to price differential was nearly 50%. Uh, and that was like 25% higher than it had been just the decade before. Uh, and Glazer and Jorko found that the principal driver of this widening spread between cost and price is local zoning. So it's not just that uh, zoning uh, drives the housing affordability and limits supply though. It also has other macro effects that we might touch on. Uh, and I'll just highlight two of them here uh, before turning it over to the rest of the panel. Number one, it's very clear from research uh, from Doug Massey and uh, Jonathan Rothwell that uh, the implementation of local zoning isn't just making housing more expensive and harder to produce, it's locking in income inequality. Particularly density restrictions have the effect of concentrating affluence, uh, providing extra normal returns to incumbent homeowners uh, who already live uh, in the more opportunity rich uh, areas, while preventing uh, the development of newer, lower cost housing in those same communities. And second, it looks like uh, excessive uh, hyper-local control of land use is now actually affecting the U.S. economy as a whole. Enrico Moretti has done some really interesting work suggesting that uh, restrictive zoning codes and other regulations in the most productive metro areas uh, have had a substantial effect on GDP over the last 50 years, maybe reducing it as much as 50% from what it otherwise would have been, admittedly in a very stylized uh, economic model. And further, uh, that relatively modest uh, liberalization of local zoning could provide a relatively near-term boost to economic output by something like 9.5%. So there's a lot at stake in getting the balance right between local zoning's important role in protecting health, uh, promoting environmental conservation and the like, and ensuring that communities actually have the range of housing supply that they need. Thanks very much. Uh, and finally, we'll have uh, Anne McCulloch, who is President and Chief Executive Officer at the Housing Partnership Equity Trust. Anne. Thank you for having me here. And a panel full of people with great data and brilliant ideas and lots of research, I'm the person who's actually buying and running apartment buildings. So I'm not going to sound nearly as erudite as my co-panelists. But all the factors that they're talking about that are really impacting housing in all sectors are impacting rental housing on a huge scale. And we are experiencing a major crisis in rental housing availability today. We have a huge portion of Americans living in rental housing. 37% of households live in rental housing. And of those, about 39 million people live in apartments. And the supply is not what it needs to be. So as a result, 50% of renter households are paying more than 30% of their income for our housing, a percentage of cost that is more than double since 1960. And construction really is not keeping pace with demand. The number of affordable rental housing units has remained largely stagnant or declined in most cities across the country, while we have seen increases in supply in the luxury and high-end rental market. Uh, but as a result, rents for luxury units have gone up at a lower rate, actually, than the rents that are being charged for affordable apartment units. Uh, which means the people in our communities who can least afford to pay the rent that they're being charged are facing the highest cost increases. And let's talk about some of those people in our communities, right? So uh, one of the biggest growing uh, job categories, given our population demographics, 
are um, home health care aides. Home health care aides make about 51% of area median income, which means they can rarely afford anything in any of our communities on an affordable basis. And there are a number of factors that are driving these cost increases, of course, and, and the panel has talked about those. Uh, the cost of land, the cost of construction, adding on the cost of regulation, and many of the regulations have been positive. Inclusionary zoning has been a major factor in driving more affordable housing into our communities. But equally, exclusionary zoning has been a factor in keeping affordable housing out of many neighborhoods that need it. And time alone is a big factor. When I talk with my developer friends, they tell me, on average, in all the cities they work in, it's about 10 years from starting an apartment project to bringing a tenant in. So we're not going to build our way out of this problem, frankly, in most of our working lifetime, which means we really have to focus on preserving the affordable supply we have today. And there, we have an equally tough story to tell. Um, I invest in workforce housing, housing that's affordable to folks making 50 to 80% of area median income, generally properties that don't have federal subsidies. So I'm bringing in institutional investors with nonprofit owner operators to really squeeze the nickel and keep housing affordable for the long term in communities. Uh, but it's tough because I'm bidding in neighborhoods across America against people who will pay cash up front. They will put down hard money deposits sight unseen without looking at the units and without caring, frankly, whether or not people can live in these apartment buildings because they don't intend for people to live in these units. They're going to run the properties at a profit for a short period of time, then they're going to scrape the land and they're going to put up something much shinier, flashier, serving a different demographic. Or they're going to take the existing property and they're going to shine it up fairly dramatically so that today's licensed practical nurse with two kids living in that house will be replaced with two financial analysts who are each making 150000 and can share the apartment. Both are good jobs, but our community needs to make sure that we have the housing to support all those people in our communities. Um, besides competition, investment capital has been very tight. This is a simple math problem. If you're going to buy properties and you're going to flip them and you're going to continue to drive up rents and you're going to drive up the cost of the property, then you can generate a pretty good return, about 12 to 15 percent for investors. And that's very attractive. If you're going to keep properties affordable for the long term, your returns are not going to be as rich. They're going to be 8 to 10 percent. And so we have to find investors who are willing to try to solve a problem for a longer period of time and take a market return, but it's a lower market return. So that's tough. Um, one of the problems that we haven't had in our space is mortgage capital. And really, that has been thanks to the GSEs, because they have continued to support workforce rental housing at scale. Uh, so there, our prices have been fairly competitive across this market sector. Um, but overall, we are out there competing every day to keep what all of us need in our community, which is the full fabric of our community and the people we need around us. Great. Well, thank you, Ann, and thank you all for uh, remaining so much on time for this uh, part of the session. Uh, and let me, let me do um, something uh, here just sort of to recap some of the issues that I was trying to write down. Um, I, I think we had... Uh, first, some stage setting about the scope of the problem, right? We heard uh, Sam uh, talking uh, about the low inventory, uh, especially the impact on the low, en the, the, uh, low end of the market, the, the um, affordable end of the market, uh, and the upcoming uh, really, well, you know, let's call it a, a, a challenge uh, by millennial buyers. Of course, a lot of those millennial buyers are living in apartments that they can't afford, uh, and there's some of those millennials who are trailing along who haven't been able to get into apartments because, uh, as Ann sort of closed us up with, uh, we also have a, a serious shortage of rental housing that, uh, that, that working people and, and young people uh, have a hard time affording. Uh, so, so we have 
that stage setting, I think everyone's pretty well aware of the scope of the crisis and the problem. Now let's talk about what some of the supply constraints are that I heard about uh, over, these five, um, over these five presentations. Um, uh, we had uh, from, uh, from Michael, uh, labor supply, lot supply, wood prices, regulations, and lending for ADC. We heard uh, about some constraints in getting uh, access to, to enough capital to buy the properties also from Anne at the end. And then uh, we also had uh, additional uh, input from Stockton on local land use regulations, which are a driver of the availability of lots. Uh, and we heard from Carlos with some backup and additional thoughts about the labor constraints, uh, as well as uh, some additional nuance on lumber. Um, so I think the first thing that I want to do, and hope, I hope I've given sort of full attention to all of the issues here, both on the impact side uh, and on the supply constraint side. Uh, but as I promised, I, I want, want you all to talk to each other a little bit uh, and either elaborate on each other's points, challenge each other, ask each other questions, uh, so that we can have uh, you informing each other and the audience watching that in real time. Who wants to start? <laughs> well, I'll start. I mean, I think, you know, we obviously want to turn uh, as much as we can anyway to some solutions or opportunities for progress. And something that the Urban Land Institute is very interested in, and I'm curious, Michael, if you guys have started to look at is, you know, within the processes, technologies, uh, and systems um, of home building and, and apartment construction, um, are there ways that um, the developers and the builders can find savings or efficiencies, whether through new modes of doing business, new technologies, whether it's prefab, 3D printing, that sort of thing? I mean, yeah. how, how much could be done by the private sector through its own innovation to at least make a dent in some of this? No, that's, um, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think kind of for me, the intuition there is that, well, okay, if we're going to increase, um, if, if we're going to somehow increase production um, when uh, the resource inputs are relatively constant or, or fairly low, then we have to have some kind of uh, innovation shock. Um, that's kind of just straight macro theory. Um, you know, I think a few, uh, and I would agree with that, um, uh, in part, in large part, because what we've seen is that uh, productivity in the construction industry, um, and it's important here to, to, to keep in mind that when we're talking about the construction industry, it's both the single family side as well as the multifamily side, as well as the commercial, um, what's going on in the commercial space. So, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're, we might lose a little bit as we generalize from residential to, uh, to, 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 to broader construction. Um, but that being said, um, you know, we have seen in the, we have the data tell us that um, in a, uh, productivity in the construction sector has lagged uh, productivity overall. Um, so that uh, is uh, another concern that I would add. If I could have talked on forever, that probably would have been on there. Uh, another slide that I would have added, but then you guys probably would have fallen asleep on me too. So, uh, but that being said, the way that we kind of address, I think you're right. Uh, number one, the manufactured housing, the prefab housing are are key ways that we're looking at uh, to, to, to shorten the time um the shorten the time, a, 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 to shorten the, the, the intensity of resource utilization, number one, but then number two, to also kind of shorten the time period of bringing housing uh, uh, to the market. So yeah, the, 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 that's kind of the, the, the dimensions along which we're, we're thinking about it. And, and I know Carlos has uh, done a lot of work and has big interest in the technology side too, so I, yeah, uh, I, I'd and really like From a policy perspective, I think it's important to note that there have been cycles of funding of housing, construction R&D in this country. Um, that uh, unfortunately are in jeopardy right now. The one sector that has been lagged um, in all the R&D efforts in the past 20, 30 years has been remodeling, and that's one that we I want to make sure that we're foregrounding as well um, because of the challenges of remodeling, developing new remodeling technology. So I don't know. Fine. Um, <clears throat> in either case, um, I, the, it's really important to note right now in this context that Department of Energy's uh, residential integration R&D program, their emergency te emerging technologies program, are proposed to be eliminated by 70 percent. Energy Star is proposed to be eliminated. EPA. Um, so we're seeing huge technology gaps 
uh, investments in uh, gaps in investment when we need to see increases in those. And do you have any sort of comments from your perspective as someone who, who actually tries to buy these properties uh, and, and upgrade them, do that as efficiently as possible uh, it, within this sort of uh, environment sure. of, of competition with uh, folks for whom the costs aren't quite as big an object? The only way housing works is if you can run it efficiently. And so one of the things that we do and all the people we compete against do is you look at older housing that was built in 1970, 1980 with windows that you can get a cool breeze through at any given time of the day and uh, roofs that can't keep the heat out or the um, cool in depending on the season and you look to see what you can do to green it up. So greening up an apartment building is the first thing you do. You have to do it and it improves the quality of life for the tenants in the building but it also means that the properties can perform economically. So any, um, any time you buy a building, your, your first list is to identify all the energy savings you're going to implement and how quickly you can get them implemented. Um, there is a lot of competition for supplies. Uh, this is a place where the supply chain challenges are impacting apartment owner operators as much as it is uh, impacting others. And when we talk with people in the supply chain, um, people who manufacture uh, wallboard and insulation and roofing materials, they're essentially just-in-time producers at this point, if not custom producers, even though they're the people you think of as large-scale manufacturers, whether it's a Johns Manville or a Masonite or, or whoever, because they've driven out all the excess in their own supply chain and so we may have a plan to green up a building, but it's going to take us time to get the supplies, to get the labor that we need to achieve those uh, enhancements. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, let, me, let me actually throw one out of my own that may be underneath some of the concerns on the availability of lots and land use uh, that Michael and Stockton were talking about, uh, and that's infrastructure. Um, I, I think. Uh, in California, uh, it's not uncommon to have impact fees of 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars per house. Uh, that's paid by apartments too, uh, and a lot of that is going to pay for roads and sewers and water supply and schools and so on. That uh, in the 1950s we used to pay for by general obligation bonds. Uh, in the 60s and the 70s, the federal government spent many billions of dollars uh, subsidizing the cost of that uh, that infrastructure. Now we're at a point where the federal government isn't picking any of uh, those costs up. Uh, and in the less expensive um, inner suburbs where perhaps you're doing a lot of your acquisition, uh, that infrastructure needs uh, a pretty major reboot uh, just when there's not the money to do it. So I'm kind of wondering uh, about your thoughts and any additional sort of uh, observations from your own experience uh, about the infrastructure side. And maybe we can come back around to infrastructure uh, when I do the lightning round or in the Q&A. Yeah, no, I think that, uh, uh, again, a lot, um, I, my original comments uh, focused on lot availability, um, but lot cost is kind of the second dimension um, across which we kind of think about uh, lots as a challenge to our builders. Um, you know, uh, A, I think the first, the first point that I want to make is that the average, uh, the average lot value is somewhere on the order of about $45,000. This is the median nationwide. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the arithmetic geeks in the room will, 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 will hear that and immediately conclude that yes, that means that half of um, the lots are priced above uh, that level. Um, but uh, the two things that, that, the two other points that I wanna make are number one, um, we have seen an increase in lot prices um, uh, since uh, since even kind of the end of the recession, uh, the end of the Great Recession, um, leading to the present period. That is 2016. That's the present that I have in mind. Um, so it's not only that lot prices are elevated, um, but also that we've seen them increasing over time. Um, and, and then the third part that I think that's important, and I think this was alluded to. So um, in fact, I think um, I think my comments are going to be kind of more second order because I think the geographic granularity that you used is a lot is a lot more precise. 
price. Um, but when we think of, when we look at lot values around the country, we do see higher prices. So if we have 40 to 45,000 as our nationwide median, um, we'll see uh, somewhere on the order of 75 to 80,000 um, in the Pacific Division. Um, again, it's important to disentangle the, the mountain division, the, the Colorado and the Montanas of the world relative to California and, 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 and Washington and Oregon. So 70, 70 to 80 thousand uh, dollars in the Pacific Division and then somewhere on the order of a hundred um, and thirty to a hundred and forty five thousand uh, for lot values in New England um, that's Maine coming all the way down to uh, just north of New York so um, you know, I, I think just adding the geographic granularity, again, housing is local, 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 and we do sit, I think when we talk about national numbers, we can miss um, some of the important, uh, 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 the, 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 the important distinctions that are taking place in, there, in different areas of the country. Anybody else want to take on infrastructure? On infrastructure? Yes, yeah, well, so if you, if you think about how uh, infrastructure improvements are financed for uh, mixed-use uh, commercial real estate developments in the urban core, uh, they're an array of very tried and true municipal finance tactics, tax increment financing, payment in lieu of taxes, uh, that have been used for years to uh, leverage the tax base um, that will increase after redevelopment uh, as a means to pay for the necessary upfront infrastructure. Um, in relatively few states uh, is that authority available to produce housing, uh, but it certainly could be. Uh, so, for example, the state of Utah uh, allows for effectively tax increment financing to add uh, new for sale and rental housing in the context of certain uh, redevelopment zones. This is one sort of very practical thing that s more states could actually do uh, that would be a, a small step towards a better uh, land use policy for residential development. We've got a bunch of these solutions in a report that we've just produced called Yes in My Backyard, and we might be able to touch on some more as we go. Great. So I think we're going to need to go to the lightning round now so that you all have some time for your Q&A and so that you can get out to the break, which is uh, scheduled for 2.15. We're going to try to get you out right in time for that. But let's do the lightning round. And the lightning round question is, uh, uh, it, and I hope somebody can pass these uh, suggestions on to uh, Dr. Calabria, because uh, his, pr his perspective on supply was that there's really not much on supply that the federal government can do uh, because it's mostly a state and local issue. Now, I think you've heard a lot of issues laid out here uh, in which there is, in fact, a federal role, a, a, a federal government role in helping reduce the supply constraints and maybe even on zoning. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the panelists have not heard each other's. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm just going to randomly ask Anne since she went last to go first, and if she takes anybody else's, you can say, she took mine, and we'll go on to the Q&A. Nobody will have mine, but I'm all about the money, right? And the Federal Reserve can have an immediate, immediate impact on the availability of investment capital for affordable housing in this country tomorrow if they will just change their comprehensive capital analysis and review framework, which today applies to the six biggest banks that are subject to global uh, investment shock. So the Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Goldman City, now all the folks who have money to put into affordable housing, well they have to assume that they are going to experience a 62.9 percent loss in value in any affordable housing public welfare investment in real estate other than tax credit investments. For tax credits they can assume they'll get a 2 percent loss in value. So if you're a big bank, the cost of investing in affordable housing or organizations who support affordable housing is very, very high. And if you're not a big bank and not subject to this rule, but you're a conscientious conservative banker, you look at the Fed saying, oh, well, that's what I should impose on the big guys. I should self-limit myself and put aside, say, 63% of capital before I invest in workforce housing. And the impact is brutal. So if the Federal Reserve would tomorrow, as they could, change their analysis on this and have it ma uh, match what you can do with Basel III, what you can do under the Volcker Rule, so that big banks and others could invest at a lower capital cost in affordable housing, that would unleash capital tomorrow. So I'm ready. Great. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask the other panelists to really make this a little more lightning, because we're going to run Sorry. out of time. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, it, this, is, uh, this, is not, this is not dissing Anne, because I didn't make it clear enough when I set us up for the panel that I really wanted to go to more like you know, 20, to tw 20 seconds or so. 
uh, a 20 second lightning strike, which is a pretty long lightning strike. I was going to say that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so you were going to say <laughs> yeah, that? I was going to say that. So, okay, no, great. No, I'm kidding. I'm so, oh, <laughs> no, you're kidding. Okay, okay, so let's go to Sam next, since we haven't heard much from Sam. Sure. I, w I would offer. So, I, first, it's a coordination problem, so that makes it difficult, but I would offer two potential solutions. First is a single family tax credit for starter homes. Starter homes have disappeared. Uh, we used to produce about 500,000, 1,800 square foot or smaller homes uh, at least 15 years ago and earlier. Today, we're producing about 100. I would structure it similar to the, the low-income housing uh, tax credit, but keep it aimed squarely at the starter home market. Second potential proposal, we have a secondary market for uh, existing residential structures. What about potentially a secondary market for uh, 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 raw land or developed land, right? So I actually was, I've been thinking about this, but didn't mention it until Michael, you made, you made the comment that a lot of these smaller community banks are stuck with the, these uh, financing these uh, uh, properties. So if, they, if these smaller banks could get them off the bo their books and turn around and, and, and lend again uh, on a land deal and take the risk off their books and have a larger, larger secondary market take the risk, that it, it could uh, provide some liquidity, um, standardization, lower rates. I'll leave it there. Great. Let me go to Carlos next. Okay. Lightning. Okay. Um, just, I'll just speak only to labor then. Um, policy recommendations. One, I actually agree with Mark Clabber about labor apprenticeships. They should be expanded, but the question is, are, are they expanding to the actual population of the workforce in the United States? Women, people of color, uh, 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 youth. Um, who's paying for them? Is it, are we just only relying on workforce, or is the industry actually going to collect, contribute to those labor apprenticeship uh, uh, funds? Uh, Two more, uh, improvement of OSHA, other safety requirements so that you're not getting people quitting or be separated for other reasons. Um, and third, comprehensive immigration reform. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying those words. <laughs> um, and we have, wait, Stockton. Yep. Uh, states have much more authority and ability to uh, encourage local jurisdictions to have a smarter land use policy that ensures for the housing <coughs> development that their communities need, uh, whether it's reducing regulations, as Minnesota has done, providing tax incentives, as Washington has done, even offering tools to override unreasonable NIMBY opposition, as Massachusetts has done. Uh, the federal government could simply shine a light on these examples and promote the fact that the state role in local land use decisions is potentially very beneficial and underutilized almost everywhere. Thank you. And uh, finally, we'll give uh, Michael the last word and then go to you. Okay. Um, gosh, uh, I'm going to try to talk quickly. Uh, I've got three. Um, the first one is uh, on the labor side, um, uh, just education. One of the things that our research has found is that uh, young people, A, are not considering the construction trades as a, uh, as a, as a place of working um, a, 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 as a future career. We ask, them, uh, uh, we ask them why not. They tell us because they don't want to do the physical manual labor. Um, we ask them, well, how much would you have to be paid in order to convince you to come into the construction industry? They say, you can't offer, us, you can't offer me anything in order to come into the industry. <laughs> um, so I think, number one, education around that is a, is, is a key issue. The second one um, is research. Um, I think there was some conversation, uh, some dialogue, some back and forth um, around, uh, around innovation. Innovation is an outcome of good research, um, and so kind of uh, policy, federal policies, I think, can step in and, and, and help that. I do think to some degree there might be a market failure there. Uh, and then the third one, this is me as a data geek, um, and that is data. Um, we can always use more data. Like I said, a lot of the data is at the construction uh, level industry overall, 23. That's the, uh, the, next, co uh, the next code. Um, but uh, kind of additional data at what's going on in the residential side across some of the da these data sources would, I think, really add uh, some precision and some accuracy to the debate to help to, to, to develop kind of the policies that, uh, that we want to see take place. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Let me give, us, give you a round of uh, applause first. And uh, I'm looking for questions now. Questions? Uh, okay, Lori first, uh, and then in the back over there. So if you go back to the 1995 to 2000 period, if you go back to the 1995 to 2000 period, we were shipping, shipping about 350,000 units of manufactured housing a year. That was 250 in 2000. Um, in 2016, it was about 80,000. So clearly one relatively easy fix is more MH. What have been the obstacles? Is it obviously zoning, financing, other, but what have, what have been the most major obstacles and what does it take to get some of this back? Okay, anybody want to take that on uh, real, real quick? Carlos, I, hear, I see your eyebrows go I up. Just, 
you name them, uh, zoning and financing, um, that are the primary issues of manufactured housing, where are you going to put these manufactured homes? There's still a stigma associated with manufactured housing, so a lot of manufactured houses during that time frame became a little more uh, 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 efficient about creating modular housing for other kinds of prefabrication. So the benefits of manufactured housing taken to this traditional single family, multifamily housing market. So there's still a lot of technology, I think that is, I would say is the third issue. Great, let's go to the next question back here. Sakai Free, DC Housing Authority. Someone touched on the 3D printed house and tiny homes. Uh, this happening in other parts of the world. What's slowing us up here? Are there any opportunities for this to really uh, level up as we move into the future? Stockton, I see you nodding. Do you have yeah, a response? Yeah, so, um, you know, as Carlos and, and Laurie's dialogue sort of suggested, you know, people have been talking about manufacture to prefab as um, a scalable solution to, to housing production, housing affordability for 30 or 40 years. Um, what we see as starting to change, I think, are two things. Number one is, um, there are new actors coming into the space um, from technology, from, from other fields, who aren't necessarily as wed to some of the traditional uh, practices of construction and development as, as sort of the industry has been. And I think they're pushing forward a, a level of disruption um, that while obviously still very small, is going to start to, to show some real breakthroughs on, on the cost and, and delivery side. Uh, number two, uh, I think we know now that if we're serious about addressing the housing supply challenge, particularly for people with lower incomes, you know, we have to sort of start to rethink and have an honest conversation about what acceptable forms and modes and types of shelter actually are. Obviously, we want to save and preserve as much of the existing stock that we sort of recognize as good quality housing as we can. But in terms of producing new, uh, we can't do it the same way we've always done it, even if we do see the kind of disruption from technology. So whether you know, it's looking at shipping containers and unconventional uh, materials and sources, or even things like 3D printing technologies, all these have to be on the table. And local policymakers who control land use and building codes have got to be much more open to new ways of delivering this essential good that, that Mark Calabria mentioned. OK, um, let me get a couple more questions on the, on the floor. Uh, Julia Gordon and anybody over here in the back uh, uh, toward the door. Julia Gordon, National Community Stabilization Trust. Um, my organization works with local community-based and mission-focused developers trying to acquire and rehab distressed REO. Um, they have two key challenges in putting these homes uh, you know, back available for, for affordable home ownership. One is the appraisal gap in a lot of these neighborhoods, which Sam, to your point, there's a large and growing coalition supporting something we're calling the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, which is a single family tax credit for rehab and construction, new construction in certain areas. We can talk about that later. But the second challenge that our buyers, developers report to us is the um, competition from investors for single family homes who have no intention of returning this home to home ownership, either they rent it out, usually in, in non-code compliant condition, or they just sit on and wait. If you look at the most recent uh, report out by Realty Track, uh, when, you, when you look at vacant and abandoned homes, y you might think they're like bank owned and in the foreclosure pipeline. That, that's a very minimal piece of this. Most of these are investor owned. Um, can you talk about the impact of how easy it is for investors to buy properties through auction sites and what impact that's having on supply? Anybody want to take that on? Um, I'll, 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 I'll uh, attempt to answer your question on kind of the impact on supply. And you know, I think there was some discussion, I think Sam might have done it, and, and it's the right answer, which is to kind of think about uh, the inventory kind of relative to uh, the, 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 the pace of sales. And so that's how we get month supply. And you know, any, month, any level of month supply under six months is typically thought of um, as, being, as indicating a shortage. And when we're over six months, then the reverse is true. Uh, but uh, 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 
another way to kind of think about uh, uh, the, the, the level of inventory is to keep in mind that the, 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 the number of renter households has increased. I think there was a comment that the rentership rate has risen to 37%. I think it was at 31% in 2005. Um, that the number of renter households has increased, and the increase was fairly consistent across all four regions of the country. Um, so, you know, thinking about on the owner occupied side, you know, you have low inventory, not just against the backdrop of the amount of sales, that, the pace of sales that are taking place, but also against the backdrop against the fact that the number of uh, of, uh, uh, of, renter occupied, of renter occupied households is also elevated. So if you kind of think about it in that framework, well, then any time a, mo a home moves um, from being owner occupied to being renter occupied, it has the effect of exacerbating the shortage, uh, both acro but across two dimensions. The first one is that the inventory of owner occupied homes has shrunk because now you have a renter occupied home, but also because the number of uh, owner the number of renter occupied households has increased. So you actually wind up kind of exacerbating both the numerator and the denominator. Um, we've done some work. We found that there are approximately 21. Uh, uh, 21 of uh, renter households for every uh, for sale owner occupied home. That's double the level uh, during at the time of the boom, uh, 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 2000 and, uh, 2005 to 2006, 2007 maybe. Um, you know, so okay, so you might not think that that is the right comparison. Um, in the in the 80s, it was about 13 renter households for every available home. Uh, in the 1990s, it was 16. So you know, again, where we are now in terms of uh, a shortage, I think that that is the impact. As it winds up exacerbating the shortage. If I may say one more thing, uh, this, the, 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 this, this idea has its uh, intellectual roots in what we call search theory. The reason why that's important is search theory kind of applies this to the labor market. Uh, the reason why that's important is because then you can use this kind of framework to then think about prices. And so then you, and the fact that, okay, well, if you have an increase in the potential demand at the same time that you're seeing lower supply, that should have an upward, that sh should put upward pressure um, on, uh, on prices at the same time. So my point is that you can, that, that there, there, it's not just in terms of the inventory of homes, but the effect could also be on uh, uh, issues of affordability. Great, thanks. And we have one more question uh, in the back. Well, actually, my name is Yaya Funusi. I don't have a question. It's just a suggestion to Michael, and I don't want you to respond because I want to go to drink my coffee. You mentioned that um, uh, the, you have problem recruiting young people to work in the housing construction. I, I understand that, but what you need to add to them, you tell them, listen, if you work in this construction, you'll be able to set up your own business on the side, you become an entrepreneur, and you will even make more money because you're having two income streams. That will motivate them to, to work in the housing. Thank you, so the role of entrepreneurship, anyone want to take that on? Sam, do you want to uh, sort of get in with well, your last actually, point? Actually, I just had a just quick response to, to Julia. Some, some municipalities have, that have had a massive influx of foreign buyers um, that just have these properties, you know, they're just using them to store money, and so they're vacant and idle and not very sort of um, socially efficient. They began to impose vacant property taxes. So that, that could be you know, sort of something to think about. You know, I don't know how popular that might be, but that's just an idea. Okay, uh, M Michael did want to respond I, to the gentleman. I, I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I, I, I think that so, you know, uh, um, uh, and this gets at kind of the way that we, uh, uh, the way this gets to me is, is the kind of the way that we look at the data. So, you know, when we're looking at uh, employment data, we're typically looking at payroll employment or the number of people that are working for employers. But, you know, one of the other, uh, another key source of labor are also kind of these single, uh, these single employer institutions or those, uh, as you said, these kind of entrepreneurs, so to speak. You know, on, on the one hand, I take your point. I, you know, the, the average incomes are going to be, uh, you know, so on the services side, there is this kind of zero one outcome where, you know, either you hit the jackpot and you become uh, an economist or a lawyer or a doctor or whatever and you have a great outcome, or, you know, you're on the other side and you have this kind of non winner circle, so to speak. You, you go into the non winner circle, so to speak. That's very different from the good side where the averages tend to be somewhere in the middle. You're neither the, win you're neither the super winner, but you're neither the super loser. I think that's right. Where I think there is some consternation, though, is that if you look at the if you look at the number of these single employer house uh, single employer uh, uh, companies in the construction in the construction industry um, over the last cycle, you see that the decline was actually more dramatic than the decline in uh, in, in, in the total number of jobs uh, uh, total number of people working for employers more generally. To the extent that that is, that that develops some kind of scarring, um, to the uh, to, to to the extent that that uh, somehow keeps people from wanting to come into and, and try that again. 
understand that I think that that's kind of the barrier that we have to jump over in order to convince people to take a more kind of entrepreneurial approach to this. So clearly in this, uh, you know, in this environment to have guarantees on protections for risk taking, uh, like health insurance, for example, uh, and, uh, and, and other of those supports that allow us to work in the gig economy that we have, uh, I think there may be some other conversation to have to make sure uh, that those supports uh, for risk takers uh, are part of the story. Uh, I have to wrap it now. Thank you all for your excellent uh, participation, you for your questions, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.
still there. Yep, there's still work out there. Dang, geez. Wow, we lost all of our crowd. <laughs> It's okay. Really well, Makes lowers the pressure on us a little bit. Welcome to our fourth and final panel for the day, moving into the digital age. What does it mean for housing and housing finance? I'd like to um, first introduce my distinguished group of panelists. Amy Brandt, um, who's the president and COO of Docutech. Brent Chandler, president and CEO of Freeform. Nina Gamsari, co-founder and CEO of Blend and Brad Thompson, the Executive Offering Lead, Mortgage and Compliance as a Service at Accenture. So thank you all very much for being with me um, today on this panel. Um, I can't help noticing how perfectly balanced we are. We've got the women at each end, the three guys in the middle. Um, we're also, my panelists are also lined up in alphabetical order by last name, which also <laughs> happens to correspond to speaking order. So I've actually asked each of them to give a three minute introduction, introducing their firm and answering the questions. Um, Describe your firm and where does it fit into the mortgage ecosystem? What was missing before you came along? And where do you see your effort going forward? So with that, we're gonna start with Amy. Great, thank you, Lori. And that's women holding down the ends here. Um, where do I point this, actually? Oh, somewhere, nebulously in the air. All right, DocuTech is a firm that's been around for 25 years. I joined this year as President Chief Operating Officer. We primarily provide documents for the mortgage industry. We've expanded that now recently into consumer finance and home equity. Um, we're looking to expand into other areas as well. But really, we provide dynamic documents for, for mortgage as the core of the business. Uh, this is just a schema of, our, of how our business works. Um, I'm sure it's enormously fascinating. But <laughs> what it does, really, is we integrate into the loan origination softwares of our counterparties and pull that data to dynamically generate docs, which is important in that it creates accurate docs every time. And getting all your disclosures, all your documents correct is really a critical part of being compliant. So that's something um, that this system does quite well with a rules engine called Conformex. And then we have carried that experience through the eSign platform, because it's not just about the content, it's also about the customer experience and delivering the best possible um, experience with these documents. And since that's Usually part of the cumbersome part of mortgage that people don't like is all the things that they have to sign and read. Delivering them in a consistent and easy format is an important part of the business. Uh, this is just a little look at our e-closing platform. We have just rolled out an e-closing platform to take that digital experience through. And we call it as e as you can be because there are quite a few regulations and rules around how far you can go uh, with e-closing and e-documents. And it, it very much depends on your jurisdiction. So we use our Conformix rules engine to best path loans to make them as E as possible. We're expanding our product into servicing and really morphing the entire platform into a customer communications management platform so that we can not only generate loan documents, but we can create any documents that are required to um, interact with the consumer along the way. We think that there's an advantage in that in servicing because of the bi-directional data that we provide. In other words, if, we, if, if our servicing client sends something to their borrower, we can then capture if they opened it, when they opened it, what was sent, what version, things like that, so that it, it's easy to track and make sure that the customer has been communicated with at the right times with the right information. That's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Am I, am I on? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear we me? We can hear you now. Yeah. Yep. Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm Brent Chandler. I'm the founder and CEO of Form Free. Delighted to be here today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do in the industry and how we are pioneers in kind of the future of the way lending looks. So we're providing a form of service that was once captured in paper. So we're automating asset, income, and employment verification data for the purposes of helping understand a borrower's true ability to pay. And it's, it, it crosses all gamuts of mortgage lending, auto lending, and consumer lending. And the way the, the way we describe ourselves in the industry is as, as pioneers in automating this, this technology, um, we, had to, we had to really look at things differently. We had to look at how the industry was performing today and where could we take it. 
So working very closely with the GSEs, unparalleled uh, experience with the GSEs <coughs> in looking at new ways to create certainty, greater purchase certainty in the loan ecosystem, uh, all the way through from the borrower, the lender experience, into the purchasers. Um, we've got a proven track record. We were first to market in 2007 as we introduced automation. We then uh, made, broke ground in 2013 with, with the first acceptance of an automated version of a typically paper uh, verification. And then again in 2014 with day one certainty and then most recently with, with the single source validation. The beauty of what automation brings to bear in terms of day one certainty and the greater purchase certainty is really a time savings. It's efficiency across the entire ecosystem of the loan, which equates to a better lending experience for the borrowers, the lenders, the purchasers. But even as important or more importantly, it's the reduction in cost by sa time savings, up to 20 days in the loan cycle. And then finally, we're looking to pioneer new, new ground. Uh, we call it three in one. And this is really the, the essence of the new announcement that Fannie Mae made at the Mortgage Bankers uh, National Conference. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's using a single pull from an asset verification to include employment and income as well. And the reason this is really exciting is that it's, again, it's enhancing the borrower experience, reducing the amount of work that has to be done. And the way we do it is looking out longer. We look at historically, we go back 12 months. We're providing the same essence of an asset verification that's traditional, 30, 60, 90 day looks, NSFs, large deposits, et cetera. But we're coupling that with employment information because now we can see a, a direct run, a trend, if you will, of uh, ACH direct deposits from an employer. And then adding to that, we're looking at the net income, cash flow, residual income discretionary income. And that's really going to bridge the gap to the future. And we see the future as really truly understanding a consumer, a borrower, at an individual level and understanding their DNA, their financial DNA at all times. Thank you. I'm Nima. I'm with Blend. Um, and like the colleagues before me, we, we aim to change the process of, of mortgage lending. Our approach is a little bit different in that we, um, we focus on that digital end-to-end -end experience. Um, the world is sort of going digital around us. And in, in a world where things are more digital, data instead of documents becomes a common thing. And so we offer a, a white-labeled end-to-end digital platform that's used by mortgage lenders ranging from some of the largest in the world to, to small community lenders. And, and that allows them to serve their customers really well and how they want to be served, meet them, allow them to meet their customer where they are. A lot of the barriers to lending, I think, sometimes are psych more psychological than anything else. And this sort of levels the playing field around those psychological barriers by allowing the customer to engage exactly how they want to. If they want to start online, they can. If they want to start offline, we also have tools for the people behind the scenes to work with the customer. And the premise is, if we do this the right way, it's a consumer-grade experience. Um, and by that, I mean, instead of asking for paper, we're asking for data. Um, instead of asking for data and then reviewing it a week later with humans, we, the system looks at that in real time and says, based on the existing credit guidelines, here's the things that we need you to understand about what this means to us as a lender and gives the consumer that transparency and simplicity. So it becomes a dynamic consumer-grade experience throughout the entire 20, 30, 40 days of the mortgage process of finding a home, shopping for a home, finding a home, et cetera. And we do work across consumer finance beyond just mortgage, but mortgage is our focus and our specialty. Um, just to put a box around what we do, what we do do is we, we, make the, we, we turn the process on its head a little bit by using data and we make the process better and more intelligent. What we don't do is change the risk models. The risk models are, are, are a thing that, you know, there are a lot of people working on that. Um, we are the best system for using the data, aggregating the data and using the data, working with partners like the ones to my left and to my right. Um, and then we use that data to then drive to the existing risk models and the risk ecosystem that's out there. A core, I think a core responsibility of a, of a technology company like ours is to be able to aggregate that data so it could be used in these newer, smarter ways. Not that we're necessarily the ones changing those. Um, we, you know, we work with, as, as you can see up there, a number of banks ranging again from small to big. We have probably 40 or so customers now. Um, we work with you know, all the loan origination systems pretty much in, on the market. 
Um, all the, you know, the team has come from a wide variety of backgrounds, ranging from enterprise to consumer. And really, our, our, our focus as a company is, you know, we think that this industry has largely been underserved by technology companies in Silicon Valley. And, and I think if you look at technology investment in this space in the last 10 years versus the last two years, it's an order of magnitude more in the last couple of years. And, and we, you know, we're sort of helping you know, lead the charge of awareness and understanding that, that this is a really interesting space. And if we can solve the problems in this space, there's massive opportunity as, a, as an industry to, to really change the way that, that lending is done over time and, and make sure more consumers have access to credit and understanding of credit so that they can um, uh, eventually you know, live you know, what they consider the American dream. And we have about a quarter of the market signed with us today ranging, again, from big lenders to small lenders. Um, and probably the biggest point of success is we track net promoter score, and we have um, you know, an extremely high net promoter score that then helps drive customers to be more excited and engaged with the financial services ecosystem. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't have any slides. <laughs> Missed my deadline. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. My name is Brad Thompson. I'm with Accenture. Um, Accenture is a, a global a consulting firm. They also participate in a number of other verticals, uh, digital technology operations. They operate in about 120 countries in about 40 different industries, specifically uh, for today, financial services, which is where I reside uh, in Accenture Credit Services. Um, I lead the uh, what we call the Mortgage Compliance as a Service offering, which we launched about 18 months ago. And what we're doing there is we're combining a number of the uh, internal Accenture assets, including the BPO arm, which is the, the fulfillment piece, the people piece, along with uh, a target operating model, a technology stack, which is uh, built on Mortgage Cadence, which is where I originally had come from. And uh, Accenture had acquired Mortgage Cadence about, uh, about four years ago. So we utilize the Mortgage Cadence platform and another, a, a few other uh, Accenture uh, assets uh, for a technology stack and then deliver that as an end-to-end -end fulfillment service out to the market and we, and we deliver that with a, uh, with a compliance and regulatory uh, warranty for execution against the work that we're doing. So essentially onboarding the loans into the Accenture platform and then delivering a closed and funded loan back to the, uh, back to the lender uh, and warrantying all the work that we do against all of that. Uh, ultimately the goal there is to drive down the cost of origination as well as to develop a one-to-many model where we can execute against a single best practices uh, operations model. And at the end of the day, we're all doing the exact same thing, even though everybody thinks there's a secret sauce to it. There really isn't. So we have a, you know, a one-to-many model, and that goes against the target operating model, as well as the technology model to, to reduce both technology costs, fulfillment, and back office costs for the lender. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so let me actually do um, some moderated Q&A, and then we'll go to the audience at the end. So the first question I'd like to ask is, who's been the audience for the digital mortgage so far? And let me start with Nima with this question. Um, who's been the audience? What are their characteristics? And what are the biggest problems facing the digital mortgage, both operationally and in terms of consumer acceptance? Yeah, I think the, 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 the interesting thing about digital mortgage is you know, people historically have thought of it as a digital as a channel that's part of many channels. They might be a branch channel or an online channel or a phone channel. Um, but really what I think most of the ecosystem is now thinking about it is it's the underlying um, sort of infrastructure about which you do business across all your channels. And, and an example is, you know, I, I got my mortgage uh, recently, my first mortgage recently with a bank that uses our product. And I met him in a branch. Um, he was local. I was in San Francisco. He's a local lender there. And because I used our software, he spent a lot more time educating and helping me understand the different options uh, and less time fit, uh, chasing down paperwork with me. Uh, so it was something where I used digital to do the process and then the, the, the ecosystem of the product options and all the things that were there uh, were more of a conversation, things that I was able to work with him on directly because it was my first time going through the process. And so I don't view digital, I, don't, I think what we're seeing in our customer base is that it's not a specific age group. In fact, 60% of our traffic through Blend, and we, you know, we're touching hundreds of thousands of these consumers now, is, is age, I believe 60% is age 40 and up. Um, and so it's a large percent. And now, granted, most people who get mortgages are, you know, I think the average age of a, a mortgage owner's higher, mortgage getter is, is higher than that. And so it's not necessarily super surprising, but it, I think it speaks to the fact that it's not just millennials. And, and One other interesting stat is 
The biggest users of mobile, we also track who uses mobile versus who uses desktop versus who uses different kinds of um, online mediums or calls in. And the biggest users of mobile are low to moderate income. Uh, so, so those are the people who maybe only have a mobile device in their home and want to get access to the system, but don't want to have to go into a branch for you know sort of a psychological examination. Those are the kinds of things that this enables. Um, again, it doesn't change the risk model, but it does allow them to do to, to interact with the institutions and in the in the, in the system in a way that makes sense for them. So they're three times as likely. You're, you're three times as likely to use mobile if you're low to moderate income than the aggregate population beyond that. Um, thank you. Um, Brenty, would you like to add anything? What do you see as the biggest problems facing the digital mortgage, um, both operationally and in terms of customer service? And Brad, if you, or Amy, if you want to jump into this as well. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, you know, uh, the human element is really is, is what I see as the biggest obstacle. Through my experience and through rolling out technology, um, you know, thinking that it was going to be an overnight success and go viral and everybody would use it because it just made sense. Um, that doesn't apply. So we have, we have what, what I deem is, is crisis management uh, as a human condition. And we're, we're, we're typically not going to change until there's absolutely a reason or we're, we're dealing with enough pain. Um, so what, we, what, what I've identified as, as the, the largest incumbent to rolling this out is, is getting from a disruptive standpoint to where the business is today and finding that middle ground where we can, as, as Nima touched on, you know, it's high touch, high tech. We've got to remember that the human is still an interested party in the transaction. And quite frankly, um, a large percentage of people still want to in interact with the human. But again, what we try to look at is how do we empower the human technically with digital information that's, high, that's much more secure, uh, has a greater, greater purchase of certainty, it's direct from source, we can do all these things with algorithms, but still keep that human interaction in, in the process. So I think it's, it's education, I think it's, it's, it's about evolution, it's, it's as these mobile devices and as the demographics are accepting new modems of, of doing this information, are utilizing this type of, of application, um, we'll begin to see that change. I don't think we're going backwards. I think this is the future. And it's just really embracing the human element and, and bridging it with the technology. So, um, Brad, what do you think getting a mortgage is going to look like five years from now? Is it going to be totally digital? You're still going to have the human element? What do you think will be automated and what won't be? And how do we get there? So, I, I think, you know, Brent and Neem have hit on this. You know, in five years, I think you're going to have, and today, you have two very different groups of people that are accessing credit. You have the traditional group that, regardless of what technologies are available to them and how easy you make it for them and, you know, whatever mobile app you're going to give them to, to expedite that process, they're still going to want to talk to somebody because it gives them a sense of comfort. But there's a, the group that's coming up, the millennial group, that they don't want to talk to anybody. They simply want the Uber experience via their phone, they want to simply put in some very basic pieces of information. They're going to expect that uh, you as the lender or as a technology provider have the ability to go out and get the information that you need in order to originate that, whether that's an information or transaction that resides in a private or a public blockchain, whether that's information available through any number of fintech technologies. You know, this, this group is going to expect a very low touch type mortgage. I want to hit three or four buttons. I want you to have all of my information. Tell me whether or not I can or can't have this mortgage and where do I go, where do I sign, and when can I move into my home. Um, so, but, but, the, but the human element, as these gentlemen have touched on, that's never going to go away. There's going to always be a group of people that are going to want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. Um, and I think that's going to be a very big struggle for a lot of lenders on how do they, how do they roll out a technology platform that enables the millennial group but still allows their, uh, their older group or those people that just simply want to have the, the voice conversation to access those uh, loan officers or whoever they need to talk to to complete that mortgage. Lori, um, can I comment on that absolutely. real quickly? Um, Please. 
the human element is also one of the impediments. I know that people still want to talk to a person. That's fine. I don't think any of us are really have envisioned a process where that doesn't exist. But there is a problem with just simply digitizing an existing process rather than re-engineering the process to conform to what's technologically able. Um, and I know Nima faces this. I've faced this when in origination shops is you, st you start digitizing pieces, but then you fall off into an older process. It's very manual. And so you see a, a sort of a lumpy process process right now. There'll be something smooth and streamlined, and then it'll go right back to the old way. And there's a lot of entrenched incumbents that will have to change the way that they do business in order to adapt to what's possible. E-close is a great example because you have settlement agents that have offices that they're used to having people come in. What if they don't need to? What if we had remote cameras? That you have, you know, the local county recorder that's, you know, somebody's aunt working in the county recorder shop, making good living, nobody wants to displace her, stamping recorded documents. So the, the list goes on and on as you go down the process of pieces and parts that are still quite manual. And without sort of re-architecting that entire process and then digitizing it, you're not going to see a truly digital experience. It would take, a, you know, a, a pretty big reimagining. So as a result of that, I think we're going to sort of lumber along to get to that and do pieces at a time. And I think, like, uh, you know, blend is a great to sort of upfront taking the customer experience and changing it on the front piece. And I, I would expect, I don't know if it's your plan or not, but that grows over time and most of the customer experience ends up there and you can re-architect and grow into it. But it'd be cool if someone could just sort of get there immediately, but I haven't seen anybody do that. Well, I think the, the reality is, and, you know, to, to build it a little, is that it's really good that, the, that nowadays, it used to be a problem, the biggest problem used to be that everyone wanted to take huge swings at this and say, we're gonna go all or nothing. And so you end up going through this massive organizational change. Um, it's a five-year project, a 10-year project, and inevitably that kind of change is extremely unlikely to succeed. And I think part of the mindset of Silicon Valley or tech is to take bite-sized chunks at this problem and solve piece by piece. And now lenders aren't saying, we want to have a big bang with us anymore, with, with Blend or with other providers anymore. Now they're saying, okay, let's solve this piece. Now let's move on to this piece. Now let's, and and that, that's, I think, the right mindset because there's way too much to do. There are so many people who touch every single loan file. If we wanted to reinvent them all at once, we'd be having the same conversation 10 years from now um, at, a, at a similar conference. And so I think it's really important. I think the biggest mindset shift that's happened has been around how do we take bite-sized pieces, solve a piece of the, um, the puzzle over time with an eye towards the end state vision of, with data and this consumer grade experience, you can drive a really amazing process for all parties involved. That's high quality, low risk, high, you know, et cetera, all those things. It's just we don't need to solve it all at once. Neva, don't you think too that the fintech companies are sort of becoming like outsourced R and D for the big banks? Like they're instead of dealing with all the technical debt they have internally, they just build data conversion layers and start outsourcing to yeah, fintech I mean, companies. Yeah, I think I think it's good. I mean, the best. Just like I think the lenders are much better. I'm not a lender. We don't lend any money at Blend, and the reason we don't lend any money. Um, is because we're just not, that's just not our core competency. We're soft, we build software. We build, we understand consumer behavior, we understand, you know, consumer grade technology, we've built consumer grade technology in the past. And so, in some ways, they're kind of saying, you're really good at this, you focus on this full time, you do nothing but this all day, every day. And then we, as, you know, whoever the bank is, will focus on building the best possible supporting you know, service, product options, all the things that really matter to a consumer from, a, from an operational perspective, they build that. And that's, I think it's a good division of responsibility where historically that didn't exist, where the banks would try to control and build a lot. Now it's more of a, there is an ecosystem of partnership, which I think is going to be hugely beneficial to the long-term progress of the industry. Yeah, actually, I'm going to switch around the order of the questions a little bit because that was actually the most striking thing as I was putting together this panel is noting that um, basically all four of you are working with established lenders one way or the other. And I'm really curious, what are the biggest pain points of doing that? You know, you always hear, well, gee, some of the established lenders have systems that are held together with spit and glue and a little bit of duct tape. And, um, and then you're trying to integrate, you know, fairly new and modern technology into that. And so why don't we actually start with um, Amy on that question and then um, Brad and then, who, then anyone else who wants to jump in. 
I mean, there does, <laughs> great. There, there does tend to be a pretty big variety in, in terms of systems and then change management and project management capabilities amongst even established lenders. So it can be challenging because the way that we work is, is really deep integration because of the amount of data transfer required to get accurate disclosures and you know, that's highly you know, technical and very precise. So you have to do a deep level of integration and some lenders are fantastic at that and some struggle a little bit more. So uh, we've seen that a lot and especially through the crisis and even as margins are still being compressed, there's just not a ton of money in all these groups for project management, change management. So we have found that to be successful with our partners, we need to augment that and we need to make sure that we're helping control that and we're putting our own project managers and staff on to make sure that it, that it works. The technical debt problems, the you know technology impediments are, are real everywhere, uh, but there's a lot of good ways to get around them now. I think because we really just need a data extract, and there's a you know a lot of ways to do that now. So that that was maybe once more of an impediment than it is now. I think when you know working with the lenders that we do, one of the things I would note is I think the industry right now is suffering from shiny object syndrome. There are a ton of new fintech technologies out there. Uh, Somewhat concerning and somewhat exciting, but many of those are uh, from outside of the mortgage industry. Uh, you know, uh, Silicon Valley has set its sights on mortgage as a as a new opportunity for new uh, new technologies and offerings and so on and so forth. And I think there's a lot of questions uh, that still haven't been answered in regards to that. If you look at the Source Media conference that they had in San Francisco last year was the first year they did it. It's a digital mortgage conference specific to you know, all things digital around the mortgage industry. Uh, this year was the second annual, and in one, in 12 months, the participants doubled, uh, maybe even more than doubled uh, from last year to this year uh, with, with uh, you know, external participants. So there's a lot of uh, options out there. There's a lot of new services. Um, but when you talk about people that aren't or haven't come from the mortgage industry and they're delivering services, are they delivering them in a compliant manner? Uh, you know, do they meet regulatory standards? If there's a failure in that service, who's responsible? Are they responsible? Are you responsible? So there's a lot of things that haven't been uh, answered yet. Um, and I think lenders are struggling to figure out who they want to partner with. What are the best services? How do they consolidate those services? Are those services going to be around in 12 months? Or are they going to be out of business? Are they going to be gobbled up by another service or a competitor? Um, so there's a lot of consolidation that's going to happen out there. And I think it's leaving a very uneasy feeling with with lenders because they're trying to become digital. They want to implement digital solutions. Uh, they want to give their borrowers a better experience uh, and they're just completely inundated and flooded with options and, and services that are out there. So I think you know over the next, I don't know, 18, 24 months, you should probably a consolidation of some of those services and more continuity as to how they're delivered. But right now it's kind of a little bit of the wild, wild west in my opinion when it comes to these FinTech technologies. Brent, do you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on, on something Amy said earlier with respect to this, um, which is really, you know, looking at the future, where, where is it headed? You know, I think, she's, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that just adding technology over the existing processes is not really what we're trying to do. We're really looking at innovative ways to bring the current industry into this time frame of technology, 2017. When and 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 change the policies and guidelines that were created in, in the in the eighties, so where these two shall meet, and so the way we look at it is is looking at the consumer from a perspective of what can they truly afford, and and bringing the mathematics and and the technology to the consumer level, just creating new ways to understand the consumer's affordability, what they can afford, and with any new evolution revolution. Which we're, we're, which we're in. We're in, you know, we, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Um, it really picked up in 2012, where we started to see a lot more players come into the scene. Uh, but more recently, and this is exciting because the fragmentation is creating innovation, which is taking this industry into the next phase of its, of its life cycle for the next 100 years, maybe. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of new entrants into the space, creating a lot of new uh, types of, of offerings, and they will be fleshed out, consolidated, uh, and, uh, and worked with. But I think it will create a, a, a different model than what we're accustomed to uh, from days gone past.
Well, the mortgage industry has been bemoaning its inability to attract young talent that not many, you know, we heard in the last panel, no one would for any price be a construction worker. And I think it wasn't much better for mortgage if you asked millennials if they wanted to go in our business. So the fact that there's so many more uh, entrants at the digital <coughs> conference excites me. If that's the place where we can start engaging and getting fresh ideas and fresh perspectives, then fantastic. Um, of course we have to be compliant, and that's usually underestimated by new entrants, the level of regulation and compliance required. But notwithstanding, when you go to the MBA and you see the homogeneity of age, race, and gender, there, you get excited to go to the digital conference. So we had a lot of discussions earlier about um, sort of income variability. It came up on the first panel with um, Dave Lohman and Andrew Bonsall. It came up on the second panel a lot. Um, so you've got both income variability, fewer sort of strict W-2 wage earners, more uh, potential borrowers have um, a lack of credit. How can technology help with this? And I'd like to start with you, Brent, because you know, because you basically you're tying together income, employment, and asset verification. You know, you're looking at a lot of bank statements. Um, you should be able to figure, it seems that you know some of the things that have been discussed is, well, gee, if you have one or two years of a clean rent history, you should be able to count that toward your mortgage. Um, and certainly, you know, looking at bank statements is one way to get it. If you've got non-mortgage, um, people who are not on the mortgage who are living in the house and contributing on a regular basis to household expenses, you might be able to see that through bank statements. If you're a teacher who's got has always got tutoring on the side, you might see that that through bank statements. How far away are we from harnessing this? And have you done anything in that area? Yeah, well, I mean, we're there. I mean, so the idea of understanding alternative data for the purpose of underwriting or, or getting a loan, it's here. I mean, we 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 see the world as as pockets of data that that we get we provide access to in a digital format. So putting practical application to underlying data that resides in, in disparate sources, which are direct source data, um, provides a wealth of information about me, the borrower. So what we want to look at is residual income, discretionary income, cash flow. We want to understand the borrower in their day-to-day -day life, not necessarily a static point in time with a DTI or, or, or a, uh, a gross income. So we're looking at all these alternatives and culling this data together while applying deep analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning understanding around this underlying data to tell a story about the borrower. Affordability, ability to pay, uh, conditions, trends. Um, it's one thing to look at credit, which is a static point in time, a historical view. But how am I doing today? Where is my money that's coming in each month going? Is it all going into a credit device? Is it going to a merchant that's reporting on a credit report? Not for my case. I've got all sorts of things that are going out in cash and you know, uh, you know, fees and so forth that just aren't captured anywhere. So how do you determine my affordability? What about the 60 million that aren't, that aren't covered in a credit report or don't have a traditional FICO? How are we assessing their affordability? So we build the technology at the consumer level that enables Brent Chandler's data to be pulled with my permission. It's not a black box that goes, hey, Brent, you can get this loan. Or, I'm sorry, you know what, this, is, this just isn't a good fit for you. How about letting me understand what's a good fit for me, and then going to a lender and saying, hey, I think I can afford this house based on the information that I, have, I know about myself. Income, employment, asset, identity, liens and judgments, credit, all in a single package analyzed, understood, ability to pay. Um, thank you. Um, with new technology comes new problems, and two that emerge from using um, personal information in the mortgage application process are first, um, as we move from documents to verified lending, how do you verify the borrower is who they say they are, and what steps do you need to take to ensure the data is accurate and stored correctly? I'm gonna have Amy start with that. And then, Nima, how big a worry is cybersecurity? To what extent do you worry about that? So Amy, then Nima, then whoever else wants to jump okay. in. Okay, um, but to a point around the having the data to underwrite different ways, I mean, that it's great to have the models, it's great to have the data. We need the guarantors to put that into their risk models because most originators are basically fulfilling against 
the um, guarantor's risk models. So maybe with some history That's of that, that would, that would happen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> on, uh, in terms of verifying data, we're moving from an era where you were once getting the data directly from the customer, usually asking them a question, and then using some sort of document to verify that what they said or anyone else in the process said that you acquired data from is in fact accurate. And now we're moving to an era where it's digitized and we're instead we're verifying data with data, or we're getting the data directly from sources. So I think when architecting these systems in, in a digital transformation, you have to think about how are we going to make sure that that data is from the source we said it was from and accurate and didn't get changed somehow. So I think you know we're looking at that as well. I think we're you know in our evolve looking at perhaps even implementing a blockchain use case to make sure that that data has not changed or remains the same. Because I think that will be a question that becomes posed more and more in the future um, by the various aggregators and guarantors. Is this is the data? Is it in fact the right data and not changed and accurate? So it's something I think we all have to kind of start thinking about how we make that transition and what we're going to do. And on security, I mean. It, you know, it used to be that security in, in this industry and other industries meant you know, how strong are the locks, how, you know, how, how many security guards do you have in front of the building that's supporting all these files. Um, the transition that's happening is information security is what security means now. And information security and the privacy around that data itself, that's fundamentally, you know, that's a technology layer. Um, and so the way I, you know, the way that we think about security in, te in, in the, 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 with respect to information security specifically is that's a technology problem and that, that needs a technology solution. Um, the best technology companies in the world, um, you know, you think about the Intuits with their, with their products and whatnot, they don't get breached because they build security from the ground up into their product. They don't have one layer of security where if something bad happens and all of their data is leaked, they'll have many layers. And so if one layer somehow is compromised by some bad actor, because there are a lot of bad actors out there. Um, they build multi-layer security so that it's encrypted at the, at the transit level, it's encrypted at the disk level, it's encrypted at the field level, it's encrypted with multiple keys, so you need multiple keys to access one, re one record. Um, those are the kinds of things, that, that and that's, I think, the, 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 the two big impacts that technology c can have in this industry. Uh, one is going to be how do we better and more intelligently support this pretty complicated process and make it a consumer-grade process, because these are consumer products at the end of the day. And then the other one is going to be, how can we keep the data safer? And I think the fact that technology is paying a lot more attention to, to this space, um, yes, it leads to the shiny object syndrome. Yes, it's not good that, um, but, but some of the best security experts in the world don't come from this industry. And so having those people focused on this problem because they understand it's an important problem are, is going to be the reason that we're able to solve it. And so yeah, creating that multi-level, multi-layer security um, is, is a critical component. And it's a technology problem that is getting a lot of focus today. Brad or Brent, do you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> okay. I don't know if hey, I could say touchy, it better than that. It's, it, it's, a touchy, it's a touchy area because I think we're all vulnerable. I mean, and, and we're dealing with such sensitive information that, you know, it's, you, you really got to tread lightly when you, when you speak about it. Um, I certainly am not a cybersecurity expert. However, I would, de I would say that we're in, the, we're in the security business first. We build applications on top of security. So, um, but I would say, I, th I think the industry, I think the world almost needs a moonshot. I mean, we need, we need to come together and really understand the threats that exist and, and, and pull together in terms of you know, looking at these threats and looking at ways that we can prevent them before the threats come. So, um, you know, we work much like, like Nima said, in, in, in paradigms in, in, in a world where, uh, you know, our, our, our security is, is done at the highest levels um, I liken it to a scene from Godfather um, when uh, Al Pacino is running across the rooftops and he's dismantling the pistol after he took out the Don and he's dropping him down the fireplace uh, shoots, you know, he's pulling it out and spreading it around. So physical partitioning of data such that if, you, if, if there is a breach, there, there's, not one pil there's not one payload of information that's going to be accessed. Let me be the optimist for one second on security here. I mean, I, the, I, obviously the capabilities of the bad actors continues to grow and their methods change and we have to stay ahead of that. But the good thing about the digital process is the, that we can work on better encryption methodologies. We can constantly enhance the way that we're getting the data. And I don't think that the old way was all really better. 
when you know you would hand a stack of documents to their loan officer and they might drive it around in their car and then turn it in you know <laughs> someone's taco stand to be under it and then you, you know I, there was a lot of issues with that and it ultimately ended up as data that could be breached anyways getting it directly from the customer or directly from the data sources and putting thoughtful security around that is a very good step i think mm -hmm. um. So we've seen um, huge improvements in technology, which definitely have a huge effect on the mortgage origination business. What about the servicing business? There hasn't been a lot of um, new technology incorporated there. Is that the next horizon? Amy, do you want to start with it? I think it's an important horizon because we talk about customer experience and we call, at least I call servicing the other 99%. And the reason I call it that is you spend, what, 45, 60 days originating a loan and then this borrower is being serviced for years. And sadly, the way that servicing is organized is it's mostly very cost constrained and uh, so there's not a ton of investment in technologies for that. So that's one of the things that has motivated us as a firm to expand our offering into communications management and servicing because communications and the efficacy of communications during the crisis was one of the big problems. So if we can do a better job integrating into a servicing system and making sure that the customer gets the right communication at the right time and we can tell that they read it and then send that information back, we just think that's you know, maybe it doesn't solve all the servicing challenges by any stretch, but it's one, it's one important one because the customer at least is, is getting information that they need. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot about transforming origination. I think servicing has to be a thought as well just because of the importance it plays. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Okay, so I'm going to move to my last question so audience start thinking of yours. Um, what's the potential of AI to aid the mortgage origination servicing business? And why don't we start with uh, Nima on this one? Sure, yeah, I think, you know, it, I break it out into two, two different buckets. Um, just for clarity again, I think that there's a, a, a lot of potential for AI on pro like changing the way the process is done um, against existing credit risk models. And then there's I think it's unclear if, if there's potential at all on uh, creating new credit risk models um, using AI or understanding the credit worthiness of borrowers. And I think to, just to really quickly address that, I think the reason that that's difficult is because there are such long feedback loops. And by the time there's a feedback loop, by the time there's a cycle where you start to understand consumer repayment behavior for a long period of time really well, the entire world has changed. And so I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that nobody's even close there, and at least from what we've seen. And so I think that there's, so going back, I think, the, but on the flip side though, the process of getting a mortgage, I think we can all agree, is not ideal today. And in most cases, it's still 40 to 60 days. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars that eventually gets passed to the consumer. Um, and there's a real opportunity there because there is a really short feedback loop. Um, there's a benefit that it's 40 to 60 days um, because that means that within you can find all the snags along the way in the process and have the system start to learn what things are going to be snags in the process and make that transparent to the, both the consumer and the lender up front and create that feedback loop so over time the system gets smarter and smarter. Um, it is a benefit for a company like ours that's standardized, we're software as a service, we're out of the box. Um, so we're able to work in the same way across lenders and so we're able to make the system smarter for all of them just because we get so much volume going through our system now. Um, again, touching hundreds of thousands of consumers means that the system is able to learn where are the snags in the process and how do we start to make those things apparent earlier in the process such that they're, you know, the biggest things that I think consumers get frustrated about is in the purchasing process at least is missing the closing date or being asked for the same thing multiple times with not enough transparency. And so I think those two things can really be solved with, with artificial intelligence. Um, it's not, again, I think we're still in the early innings of that one, but that's one that I think there's, there's a real opportunity to make the process better than it is today. Well, you can use AI with robotics to fix a lot of problems in a clunky system. So you can use it for finding patterns, for form fill, doing little manual move data tasks. There's a lot of little sort of little use cases that if you start itching away at it, you can even make a crummy old system look pretty decent to the user by <laughs> speeding it up with AI and robotics. And that's a great point. It, you know, it, it, in, in the MCAS model that we're building out, we've been able to cut huge amounts of cost out of the back end and the fulfillment process through the use of robotics uh, to perform low cognitive, highly repetitive type tasks where normally I'd have you know, 100 people doing the same thing over and over and over. Well, now I can have five bots deployed running 24 seven and I can redeploy that same 100 people to other things, Could more you complex Could give a specific loans. example, maybe? That well, uh, one of the areas that, uh, that we use this quite a bit is in the appraisal process because you know, we don't have an integration to every single 
uh, you know, appraisal management company or appraisal group. And so we've got bots out there that are logging into our systems, grabbing that information, logging into the right appraisal organization, ordering that appraisal and sitting and waiting, getting that information, logging back in and applying that information and then pushing that loan where it needs to go. Normally I'd have somebody sitting there, you know, calling, checking online, logging into that system, waiting for a status, has it come back, where are the docs, all of that thing. Well, now I have a bot that sits there and does that and I redeploy that person to go do something that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's more worthwhile for their time. Yeah, yeah. Another, another, oh yeah, go ahead. We, we, use, we use, I see AI in both <clears throat> in, in the current processes of how we look at data and pattern recognition is one thing, fraud detection and, and other types of things, but natural language learning interpretation around the consistent millions and billions of data bytes that we're pulling. Um, but also in the future. So as we look forward and we understand probability to pay, we understand propensity to pay based on models. But as we look at probability to pay, you know, are we seeing indicators in the data that we're pulling that could lead to distress, uh, that could potentially uh, need an advanced warning or some additional help. So the models that we're looking at is really staying with the consumer a little bit longer post-close. I mean, we, we close the loan, they move on, it's a one and done deal, right? Well, in the future, staying with that particular borrower in the lending cycle so that the servicing models, um, we can understand this borrower as they go through life and introduce um, additional facilities and, and help them through distress situations. So we're looking at AI on a go forward basis to think about weather, to think about health conditions, to think about financial situations that we can reach out. So when I give you permission to look me up for loan origination purposes, to what extent does that data continue? Or I mean, I, I, you're dealing with old data at that point, aren't you, or not necessarily? Well, the beauty, the beauty of what, you know, we're talking a little bit futuristic, but we're looking into the future. But the beauty about the data that we're talking about is permission. It's with your blessing. So we're asking the borrower, and, and there's incentives, right? So we're going we're gonna to get through a loan process faster in the existing models. Yeah. With, with, with our products today, we're gathering this data and making, making it smart. So we're, we're shaving 20 days off uh, the loan cycle. Yeah, nobody goes to Credit Karma or Mint or one of these aggregators of personal financial management and says, pull it once and tell me my current financial situation. They, they do that because they want the ongoing help. There's a benefit for them. And so it is very clear to them that that's happening. It's something that they're, they're permissioning, but that's, there's a benefit to them. And so I think to the extent there's a benefit for the, benefit for the consumer, the consumer will opt into these things. Um, and I, assuming that you can also, I think it's also important to clearly explain what that means because you get into a lot of gray areas where if it's in a bunch of really small text on a screen, no, but like the, the entire product of Mint.com is ongoing personal financial management. And so I think it's pretty clear in that point that they can help you with that. Yeah, I, I, she, she, was, she was just calling out that. The piece was that lower income people were doing business yeah. on the telephone. So we're, 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 we're looking at all demographics and all individuals. Yeah, I mean, that, if there's one takeaway that I think we've had that was yeah. a surprise to us was just the different cohorts that actually use the technology and how they use it. Because I, I, I think people, you know, always had this perception that, yeah, this is where it's going to fit. But it turns out the digital is sort of. Um, you know, I'm excited. I'm getting the new iPhone 10 on Friday. It's like it's just the way that we <laughs> we work these days um, as a society. Now, not everybody, and not for everything, but it's a way. It's underlying everything we do, and, and it's created a lot of benefits for I think for different kinds of communities as well that might be lower income, etc. Uh, questions from the questions from the audience. Faith, and then Jean. <laughs> as an as an aging baby boomer, I like a fast close mortgage too. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I agree with that. Quicker so you, the better. So you don't want a slower, more expensive product. <laughs> Weird. You don't want a fast. Uh, Gene Spencer, HBF. Uh, just following up on your comment and your comments, Nima, uh, about you know the, the your findings or discoveries about how consu uh, consumers react to different digital applications. And I just want, can you give us a little bit more insights into how you go about that process? Because there's some, and then what uh, has surprised you most? when you're learning about consumer reactions to 
various digital applications. Sure. So, so how we track it? Just you know, our system is something that consumers use too. That is, it's white labeled. It's the lender's brand. But we we track consumer behavior in term, including satisfaction, but also um, how they you know how they how they use the system itself because we want to find snags in the system and make it a better system for the consumer. It has to be a consumer grade product. And so basically, I, the way I would think about it is there are sensors along every step of the way that are completely anonymized that just basically say, what is, where, is somebody falling off? Are people falling off at this point? Um, and, and the premise there is if we have an understanding of how different kinds of, um, uh, how different kinds of people are able to use a product like this, or I guess get a mortgage uh, electronically, um, we'll be able to eventually create and a thing that's optimized for the entire consumer community and allow all, all those different kinds of customers to come in. So one of the interesting things I mentioned was that the low income user is mostly using mobile. Another thing is um, we started, and this was purely as a reaction to we saw people falling off in, in the process and they were getting stuck, they were getting the income screen, they were saying, you know, I don't really know, I'm a little confused, I'm gonna go offline. Um, and so we started talking to the consumers with their permission and the loan officers with their permission about why they were doing that. And we found that in the, there's certain parts in the process where having just basic education built in. So think of it like the, um, uh, like the little help text, the little button that you can push to pop out help text can greatly improve pull through. Um, so on the income section, what does it mean to have an LLC? What does it mean to have, what does it mean to be self-employed? What does it mean to, to have contractor income? What does it mean to have social security? So injecting that help throughout the process, we, we could just call it contextual help because it's in the context of what you're doing, has greatly improved the consumer's ability to get through the process without help. Um, Chuck, and then over here. Chuck here and then over here. Uh, Chuck Mocking, please. Um, you're all handling sensitive data, and you're all, uh, if you get to scale, are, are going to be handling lots and lots of sensitive data. How do you think about and manage the potential liability uh, process? Some of you are, particularly in the fintech space, which I spend a lot of time with, there are a lot of people that are handling a lot of stuff that are essentially judgment proof. Uh, uh, so how do, you, how do you handle the exposure and liability for the inevitable fails? Yeah, I can take a crack at it. I mean, we, we take on a lot of liability there. We, we put a lot of effort, and part of it is, you know, I think of it more as, in, in some ways, as an opportunity for us to build the most secure system in the world. So we built a security team when we were six people. We started, we hired our first security person, and he was an engineer, and he built a whole team now, and we have a whole part of the company that's on security. And so, yes, there's liability. There's liability with any company that handles data, whether it's Intuit, whether it's a small company, a startup. And so for us, as we've gotten to scale, we've just put more and more investment in putting more and more layers of security so there's not a single point of failure. I think most of the time when we see failures in systems, there's a single point of failure. And it's not like there were seven things that all got compromised at once. It was one thing that was was compromised and that was, a single, and so we, we don't have a single person who's responsible for security. We don't have a single point that you can compromise to get to the data. And so we, and so then from a liability perspective, that's something that we take on and we, you know, we, we raise a lot more money than necessarily we needed to, to be able to, to, to handle that kind of liability if it should, something should arise. We, and we do pretty much, you know, as, as we develop applications, you know, like mortgage cadence, obviously it starts there from an architecture standpoint, from a security standpoint, but we also rely heavily on our uh, third-party providers and our hosting uh, solutions that are that are delivering those applications out to the uh, out to the market for us um, and then you know to Nima's point ultimately Accenture is responsible for that data and that's part of our compliance and regulatory warranty under MCAS is that if you know there is a data breach or or you know some financial harm caused to an institution based on you know our our uh, you know uh, security protocols around that data then Accenture ultimately is, is responsible and liable for that to, to build on that excellent question, um, the core interaction, the moment of truth in this business is when people get paid. It's also the biggest vulnerability in the process. What are you all doing to be sure that you get the money right? And just to clarify, you're talking about the, 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 the funding at the end and, and the- 18 people get paid and a lot of times the money goes to some place it's not supposed to go to. What are you doing about that? 
Yeah. Yeah. Admittedly, we're not touching that part of the process today. Um, I have heard stories about people getting playing man in the middle attacks and getting somehow the money to get wired to the wrong account. Um, not related to any specific system that's out there, uh, just more generally people. And so we don't play a role in that space today. We're not touching that part of the, the process today, but I think it's an interesting area for opportunity to, as part of a secure system, create a mechanism to, to make that transfer better. So, so one, of the things, one of the things that we've done is create this concept of a reissue key, and it's, it's really capturing the essence of direct source data. And being that disinterested third party, we're responsible for the underlying data that works with the, the uh, parties involved. So the lenders, the underwriters, the purchasers, and the borrowers. Uh, and that reissue key. You're verifying the accounts? Oh, we're yeah. Yeah, we're verifying all that information and then assembling it and then, and then creating a single key, a 10 digit key, that is the, the, the essence of, of accessing this information for all of the other parties that are authorized. Elena. So right before lunch, we had Hans Morris here. He was, um, uh, I think he's involved, or maybe the venture capital, involved with Blend as well. We, he he um, mentioned that you know, in 2012, there weren't very many fintech startups that were focused on mortgage technology. And you guys mentioned just earlier, there's hundreds now that are, and many of them well-funded, that are focused on, on mortgage and real estate. One of the things that he illuminated that I just wanted to ask you all about, and it kind of connects back to Jackson's question a little bit, um, the mortgage process end-to-end -end has a huge number of players and participants involved, from the consumer experience before they ever apply, the org origination process, all the things that happen in between, the closing, servicing, then you go into the capital markets and you know, all the people that are involved in that process. Um, it seems like, from what he showed us, capital markets, the origination process, payments, servicing, property management, title insurance, there's a little company for each one of those parts of the process. And one of the fundamental complexities of mortgage is the fact that there's so many touch points and so many people involved. And it seems like technology is building itself around that kind of not good process. So my question to you all is, how do you see sort of where do you see or who do you see being the sort of integration mechanism to take all these disparate parts that are being built and all these different companies that are hand handling different parts of the process who brings that all together? And, and where, where, you know, where to, to Jackson's point about who, you know, who's getting paid and all these things, where do you see that, um, that, that information sort of starting to come together so it feels like a more, more um, cohesive experience? I would say you know, there, there's a lot of niche fintechs growing in, in not just mortgage, but in banking in general. So the, the way that that aggregates together is the way that these, these fintechs are architecting around integratable APIs to make them fit into an overall technology ecosystem with partners. I know from our perspective, partners are very, very critical. And we know that we need to integrate well with them and so data flows seamlessly and that the experience isn't compromised. I think the answer to your question is there's probably two places in mortgage where that ends up happening. It's the point of sale tools. I think will take on more and more responsibility for the customer interaction, and they will aggregate up the various partners required to provide, you know, different parts of the experience or data or whatever, is, you know, an appraisal, title, all that into into the process. And in the back end, on the operator side, it's the the loan origination softwares. And you see that, you know, like with the big ones like Encompass that are have a lot of integrations and they're moving to an API structure to integrate partners. So I think the, the short answer is all of the players are starting to figure out we have to be integratable in an ecosystem. None of us can stand alone. And, I, and I'll just add, I think you're going to see consolidation with a lot of the, a lot of the shiny object players. But, um, but also, if you look at the GSEs and what they're doing to create these ecosystems, um, and you look at you know, companies like, like NEMA's, Blend, uh, it's creating a whole new kind of full service process. And, and, and then you have the POS providers. And then you have niche players like Formfree that are integrating with, with all of the above. Yeah, we put a lot of burden on ourselves to do that. And it's hard because it's, there's so many participants that we have to prioritize, OK, what's the next big lift that we can get? And it's a lot of work. And doing it in the right way, in a prescriptive way that's reusable across the industry is even harder. Um, and so for us, it, it goes back to what's the right next big step that we can take? And how do we do it in a repeatable way so that we don't build a custom integration for a bank and B bank and C bank for every one of these, because then we're stuck in the old way of doing things. Right, good. 
question. Last question. <laughs> The question is, with day one certainty loans, at what point, does the, what point in the process does the customer log into form free? That's a great question, and it's as soon as possible. So it could be at the POS, it could be in the LOS, it could be at the AUS, but it's really up to the lender and their workflow. So we live in all of those areas, but the day one certainty comes immediately once they've, been, once they've gone through our process. Ideally, it's up front. Yeah, it, could be, it should be minute one certainty, I think. It should be you know, the moment that the customer's engaged, before they go through a lengthy process with you, make sure that they know everything that they need to know about themselves. Well, I'd like to, we're at time. I'd like to thank our superb panel. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being with us today. I'd like to thank um, Elena McCargo, um, Frank Notaf, Sam Cater, um, Todd Hill for their instrumental role in pulling the, today's, today's um, symposium together. So thank you all. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Neil. Are we getting together soon?